This episode of the We Like Shooting Show is brought to you by Second Call Defense, Manicore Arms, the Sonoran Desert Institute, Facts and Firearms, the Patriot Patch Company, and Brownells. Welcome to the We Like Shooting Show, episode 292. Tonight we're going to talk about the IWI Jericho, Painting with Guns, the Black Collar Arms Pork Sword, a new segment that isn't all about Washington, the Black MacGyver, and more. Our panel tonight is River's Edge Tactical's very own Jeremy Paz Derek. Also with us, we've got your friend and mine, the Machine Gun Moses, Aaron Krieger. Nick Lynch is beside me. My name is Sean Heron, and I want to welcome you all to the show. Yeah, that worked That worked really well for me, I thought. Uh, I was a little bit nervous, but I oh, think, yeah. yeah. It what, brought a smile to my face. It, did it? That's good, Aaron. That's yeah. re- that's really good. We make some, made some last-minute changes there, and I think we rolled with them pretty good. But, hey, guys, before we do anything else, let's talk about Manicor Arms. All right. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Uh, ask Nick to tell you one thing that you didn't know about Manicor Arms. Man, you're killing it tonight. Nick, tell me something I don't know about Manicor Arms. Uh, Manicor Arms has put out some very, very cool denim jackets <laughs> with the Manicor Arms logo on I the I saw you wear that to Silverton the other day. <laughs> yes, I did. What yes. happened to the sleeves on that, Nick? Uh, I removed them. Yeah, he cut off the sleeves of the denim jacket. Yes, I got to tell you. Now uh, it is a denim it looks, vest. It looks awesome that way. Oh, yeah. It's dope as hell. It, it actually really does. Yeah. I hope you wear it every range day from now on. That's kind of my plan, yeah. Yeah. I think that would actually be that's, great. That's part of why I cut the sleeves off so that I can still wear it when it's warm out. But oh, in, yeah. in addition to 80s denim, they also make a lot of stuff, whether it's for your uh, Tavor products or your IWI products, the X95, the Tavor, uh, Transformer Rails, one that we all love, muzzle devices that are fantastic. Check out the Nightbreak. Just go to their website, manicorearms.com. Check out their social media, Manicore Arms on both Facebook and Instagram. And guess what? You don't have to pay full price. WLS 10 gets you 10% off all day, every single day. And uh, that's, once again, Manticore Arms. All right, guys. First up, we do have this drinking game that we play. And, uh, you know, we, we just kind of brought it back. And I think people are enjoying it. So as long as they don't play uh, anywhere but stoplights, we'll be just fine. All right, so... Anytime that I say interesting, start a sentence with so, say basically nice or dang. Anytime that Aaron says by curious, suggest that registration does not lead to confiscation or interrupt somebody. Okay. Every time Jeremy says kill yourself, call Savage a commie or sniffle spits or hate breeze into the mic. Every time Nick says something insightful, says something that no one laughs at, or Savage mentions Reddit, mispronounces a sponsor, Washington, or damn gun of the pores. That's when we all, and you, will drink. Take a drink. Well, you know, uh, the Savage one's like getting a free pass on bingo tonight. It's also the best way to have liver failure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. We do have a guest tonight, and he is a modern survivalist, an American ninja, a knife maker, a writer. On his own website, it says he's the Black MacGyver. Please welcome Hakim Isler. I said Hakim for some reason. Hakim Isler. <laughs> How's it going, man? <laughs> Hey, what's up, guys? Glad uh, Kim sounds like a like a like you just heard a good joke from yeah. your friend Kim, dude. Uh, I, Kim. <laughs> I don't know what my problem is. I, I asked him how to say his last name because I was like the first name, no problem, and then I mispronounced his first name. <laughs> I, I don't even know what's going on. So, thanks for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot to break down in there, uh, like ninja, survivalist, all these other things. But let's just kind of start at the beginning. Um, you were former military, did a couple tours. Tell us what brought you to that path. Um, so at the time I was at the time 9-11 happened, I was in uh, Ohio uh, training with my teacher in this ninja martial arts. Um, and um, when 9-11 happened, I was just like, I want to use my skill sets and the things that I'm enjoying doing with my teacher. I want to get better at those. And I also want to use those to, to serve my country. And so um, I joined the army and joined psychological operations and went into uh, some formal teaching uh, through the U.S. Army on how to do basically psychological warfare and understand all those different aspects. So, um, and that's that's what got me into the military. Very interesting. So, psychological warfare, like, kind of define that for us. So is, what, I mean, is that just like yelling at people until they like don't want to be here anymore, or what is it? It could it could be. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, um, it, it, it could, it's, psy- PSYOP is like a huge, vast 
uh, thing. So, you know, uh, many people may know, like, you know, propaganda is really huge, um, using different media outlets, using hand to hand, face to face. Uh, you might, you know, talk to someone and, and try to get them to do a certain thing or feel a certain way. You might use music as a way to do that. Most people uh, in the military, you know, because we've become infamous for having speakers on top of our vehicles and driving around, they, they'll say, oh, you know, these these guys are the DJs, you know, out here <laughs> <laughs> and playing music. Hey, play us some rock music to get us hyped up so we can go out and do some stuff, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, ultimately... Uh, we have a, a, a bunch of different things that we do and we get involved in, uh, you know, some more behind the scenes, some more out front. So it just depends. And I think like like dropping leaflets into villages and like that, that's all kind of under that purview, right? Yeah, that is. That's PSYOP as well. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's pretty that's pretty damn interesting. Uh, you said that you were training in Ohio. Uh, first off, I'm sorry that you're in Ohio because Jeremy is also in <laughs> Ohio and, you know. <laughs> You. <laughs> that's that's the smell you've been smelling. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. Uh, but yeah, you said you were training and martial arts training, uh, specifically ninja. Man, like, what the hell's up with that? Yeah, that's a pretty crazy story. So when I was nine years old, like all boys, I told my mom I wanted to be a ninja because she asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. Yeah, I wanted to be a ninja too. Instead, I'm a fat drunk. <laughs> with your hanging. That that actually sounds more deadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good point. Deadly for him. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, you know, but then uh, later on in my life, after doing martial arts for many years, uh, when I became 21, I decided, yeah, I definitely want to do martial arts, dedicate my life to it. But I wasn't sure which one. A friend mentioned the ninja martial arts. I looked it up, found out that it was a real thing, and the guy I lived – the first American to do it, Stephen K. Hayes, he brought he brought it back from Japan, was living in uh, Ohio, of all places. So went there, checked it out, loved it, said, hey, I want to do this. Came home, told my mom, I, I'm going to move to Ohio with no friends, no family. This is what I'm going to do. She thought I was nuts. All my friends thought I was nuts. Uh, but that's what I did. I packed up, saved up $1,200 and moved to Ohio. That was, that was, that, that was the beginning of that journey. Are you, are you north or south? I was in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, so you're on the other end of the state from me. Key. Well, Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's not like you guys are having a meetup or something, Jeremy. Right. Well, no. <laughs> if <laughs> if <laughs> we run into each other, it was close to be like, hey, come well, on. You have- right. God, He's in I'm Valley like City. Cle- I'm up like Cleveland. 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 Okay. Yeah. Can yeah. he not hear me? I, I don't no. think so. No one can. I can. I know I can. Oh, I, I can hear yeah. Jeremy. So, like, when, when I think Ninja Man, I'm thinking, like, tabby boots and face masks and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> what 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 was it that drew you to it and kind of what what did you focus on as far as learning skills and things like that? Um, so that's a great question. So, um, and like you said, most people think that from the movies and things of that nature. But uh, really, Ninja were more like Japanese version of, like, the CIA. So... Uh, being, you know, blending in with the environment, whether it be uh, a wilderness environment or a people environment, that was that that was the idea behind it. And understanding how people operate and what made them work was what really what set them apart uh, because they they had limited resources. They were fighting a, a well-equipped, you know, force um, against a well-equipped equipped force. And so they, they really had to understand uh, psychological warfare and understand guerrilla warfare. And so that was really their, their primary. So when I went to Ohio to train, what really drew to, drew me to it was that at the time I was training in a bunch of different martial arts systems. And, you know, I had this belief that no one martial art is the best. You need to be well-versed and well-rounded. And, um, and once I started reading about the ninja, I found out that these guys were doing it way back in the 1100s. You know, they thought, oh, man, we don't know what we'll face out there. So we have to be good in like striking and throwing and, you know, uh, psychological warfare and blending in with the environment, stealth, you know, tactics and all that stuff was like, wow, you know, let me go and learn and see what this is about. And so when I got there, you know, oddly enough, there was in this commercial building in Ohio. <laughs> and so I was like, Oh, what is this? You know, this is crazy. But after talking to Mr. Hayes, uh, Stephen Hayes and, and really digging into the crux of it, I found out there was a world behind that 
that, uh, you know, that maybe I could get to if I, if I stuck around. And so that's what I decided to do. So do you guys work best when there's four of you, one with the bow staff, one with the katana, one with some nunchucks, and some with some of uh, those, I think they're called the size, Scythe. those knives? Scythe. So, so that's when we work best, and when yeah. we have when we have a shell green. Yes, <laughs> yes, because so. those guys blend in perfectly. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's actually where I learned my my most deadly secrets of ninjutsu was from a hairy rat. That <laughs> it's so weird. It's so familiar to me. I don't know. You met my brother. Oh, so weird. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, so, what kind of like combatives? Uh, D- does like uh, American Ninja, does it focus on like uh, fighting styles? Does it focus on combatives? Is it more focused on like forms and kata and things like that? Or is it more of a, a deadly art or is it kind of everything all inclusive? It's really all inclusive. So the whole goal of ninjutsu is to, to be able to overcome whatever obstacles you might face. Now, that obstacle might be a physical fight uh, and that fight could be anything. Right. It could be shooting. It could be knife fighting. It, it could be, you know, somebody trying to take you down and grapple you or multiple people trying to attack you. But it could also be somebody in the corporate environment trying to socially manipulate you. Right. Uh, so all of those things fall within the realm of understanding. And so one of the things that really make Ninja a little bit different is in, in the way we approach it is that we think that. Everyone, every human being is a manifestation of how they feel on the inside, mentally and emotionally. So if you're mentally and emotionally one way, if you actually, when you operate in the world, you operate in the world that way, right? So if, I, if I'm very aggressive mentally and emotionally, I tend to, that tends to show up in my life quite often. And so the, by understanding your opponent or a person, period, uh, you can really understand how they're going to operate. And by understanding how they operate, you can understand the things that could either calm them down, set them off, make them, you know, submissive, whatever the case may be, whatever you're trying to accomplish. And so that was really, so that translates into everything, you know, because if you are an aggressive, if you have an aggressive mindset, then you talk to people aggressively, you normally fight aggressively. um, And so I can take that information, I can use it. That's why it translated really well over to psychological operations because psychological operations is really about breaking down a foreign target audience and then figuring out what it is that your commander wants and what best way to create that in an environment that you're operating in. So, um, you know, so it's a little bit more than the pun- what we call the punch chop kick, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it's, it's really uh, in depth, you know, so you have to be competent in, you know, in, in striking and, knife stuff and, you know, grappling. Um, But you really have to be confident in your strategy and your psychology. You know, what can be used against you? What can you use against other people uh, who are trying to harm you or trying to harm other good people, you know? Well, going on uh, the whole uh, psychological warfare and then going into psych ops and stuff, Mm -hmm. um, do you see, like, uh, the media kind of of doing the same thing these days? Yeah, that was... That was really, that was really tough for me. Um, you know, I say that, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, really issues when I came home, my, my, uh, my home is really close to post. And so, you know, I hear mortars going off and gunshots all the time because it's not far from the range here at post in Fort Bragg. So, uh, when I came back, that made me feel real comfortable, you know, uh, from my last deployment. So my wife was like, all right, that's crazy. That, that keeps me up at night. I'm like, actually, it helps me go to sleep at night. <laughs> so I didn't have I wasn't suffering uh, from any type of mental trauma based on, you know, gunfire and things of that nature. But the things that I did have issues with was uh, when I came home, looking at the media, looking at television, because, uh, you know, we had you know, it was our job to really take those sources and kind of mold them in ways that, you know, could have an effect on the populace that we were, we were working. So when I came home, I could see very clearly uh, information and media doing exactly what I was doing in a, in a small room and creating things and seeing those effects happen in the real world. You know, it's one thing when you're like, 
you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons on your own and you and your buddies are like making stuff happen, you know, throwing lightning at each other in the, in the living room. But uh, when you create a uh, concept, you know, and, you know, and you're trying to create uh, actions in a community and then all of a sudden you, you and some guys brainstorm a way to make that happen. You throw out some leaflets, you create some sort of information and push this out in certain uh, outlets. And the next thing you know, you see hundreds, thousands of people doing what you uh, created on a sheet of paper. Um, It really makes you kind of weird when you get home and you start watching people say certain things on the news and do certain things in social media. And you're like, whoa, I'm I'm now a part of that system, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, somebody's out there doing what I was doing over there, but they're doing it here, you know? So that made me very, uh, you know, uh, uncomfortable. It made me very I mean, sick. Can, can you see like how the American people, our people are so easily manipulated by the media itself? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it, it, it becomes, it becomes overwhelming actually. It's so, it's so easy to, you know, we, we get so wrapped up into uh, this is the way – this is my belief and my belief is the only belief. And, and, and it makes – because you're so wanting to defend that, it makes it very easy to pull you in one way or the other uh, versus uh, the ninja kind of have this saying that we say. We say truth is relative. Try to see things from others' perspective without losing your own. Try to see things the way they are but stay tuned in, right? Um, so – what can I – so basically that's telling me – oh, man, give me one second. I lost you on the screen. I don't know what how that – We're here. I like the Assassin's uh, Creed model. There we go. So basically what that's telling me is, uh, you know, that, hey, I have my truth. This person has a truth over here. It might be different, but, you know, they see it from their perspective. So I'm trying to see it from their perspective. I'm trying to be bigger than my own uh, perspective. Um, and I'm trying to stay tuned in. I don't want to lose my perspective. I'm not saying, hey, I'm giving up my beliefs because you got, you know. Uh, but what I am saying is that as a ninja, you know, my goal is to operate beyond that, beyond those limits. As a psyop warrior, my my goal is to operate beyond that. You know, um, it's one thing, you know, when I was overseas quite often, you know, you would hear people say, oh, these guys are idiots. They're stupid. You know, we should be able to take these dudes down. I'm like, actually... You know, some of maybe the guy who blows himself up, that guy might not be that smart, but uh, there's somebody who's who's really wise in the background, who's who's manipulating things and twisting things to look certain ways. And that dude is uh, that dude is a formidable opponent. So I'm not trying to I'm not trying to give that guy a leg up on me by saying he's stupid. Actually, I'm going to see his brilliance and I'm going to work to counteract that brilliance. So, you know, by uh, shining light on it in whatever way I possibly can. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Jeremy, what were you going to say? I said, oh, the Assassin's Creed motto is better. Uh, everything is permitted. Nothing is uh, forbidden. There you go. I'm, I'm more of a fan of that. <laughs> I like it. I can't hear Jeremy at all. I know. That's so weird because you can hear. I don't know why. You can hear Aaron, right? Aaron, give me a sound check. What's up, Buttercup? Can you hear him? Yeah, I, can, I can't hear Aaron. Y- yeah. You can hear Aaron. Yeah, that's yes. it's so weird. I've, I've asked him several questions. I know. Yeah. I know. It's amazing that you can't hear Jeremy at <laughs> maybe all. Maybe he blocked Jeremy out of you know common sense. Not right. Yeah. He, he actually <laughs> – or maybe he's waging psychological warfare against Jeremy right now because <laughs> oh, he saw – that would be badass. He's like, Jeremy's a big dude, thinks he's going to take shit over. I'm going to pretend like he doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> he's He's got the, the psyops going on. Exactly. Man. Eventually, Jeremy's going to get so mad he's going to rage quit. And get his first uh, stateside, probably. I don't know. So, are you are you a fan of uh, Psychonauts, and are you excited about Psychonauts two coming out? Since it's sort of about what you did in the military. Is that a movie? Like a movie? Television no, no, show? that's a it's a video game. Oh Jesus! No. Never heard of PS two. No, but tell me about it. I might I might have to go get it. Just oh to, just- yeah, no, it's awesome. It's about. Uh, psychic warriors who go into people's minds and uh uh wage war that way you, you lost me a psychic <laughs> you lost yeah I, <laughs> I don't know well that's that's what we've been talking about right he keeps saying psi psi no. psyops psychic psychological operations 
I mean, that's cool too, but not <laughs> like, as cool. Is it, kind of like, is it like Psylocke from uh, uh, X Men? Uh, I mean, she's pretty cool. I don't know. Anyway, uh, get, getting back to this stuff. So, dude, Black MacGyver. What? The, where the hell did that come from? Um, so that actually came from some friends of mine that were uh, military, and those. I'm I'm a very like weird character where I'm always thinking like these kooky ideas and and uh and and coming out with these different concepts. So it was like somebody ended up mentioning, Man, you're just crazy, blah blah blah. I can't remember exactly how the sentence goes, but it ended with you're like the black MacGyver and everybody just died laughing, like, you know, and so we thought it was the funniest thing, so it became like kind of a joke. And um, but, you know, because I kept inventing and creating and doing stuff that was outside of the box, it just stuck. And it was just one of the things that, you know, um, that I that I held on to. And, you know, I still promote it. I, I, I like to laugh at myself every so often and not take myself so serious. So I think that gives me, you know, it's cool. You know, that MacGyver air gives me like a cool, funny, you know, quirky sense about me at the same token. You know, so I don't I don't take myself too serious. So so you can be honest with me. Did you have a mullet, man? Did I did you? not have a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> not in anywhere sure. that I could. Not in anywhere I could show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's not true. Aaron will look. <laughs> <laughs> so survivalist stuff, uh, like survival and kind of like prepping style stuff. How'd you get into that? Uh, so that you know, obviously, that started as my ninja aspect, right? So uh, the ninja were uh, Japanese, Japan's greatest uh, survivalists. You know, these guys lived off the land, out where nobody else could go, or very few people wanted to go. Their lineage comes from a group of uh, like warrior monks called the Yamabushi that hung out in like the, the wild and you know did all this crazy stuff, living off the land. And, um, and so, you know, talking to my teacher, uh, Stephen Hayes, you know, and us having conversations and him telling me about that background, I spent a lot of time with him exploring that. And uh, then, of course, joined the Army, went through uh, different wilderness training there and then went to SEER school. And SEER school was really awesome. I uh, learned a lot about myself and uh, got out of the military, started doing stuff here and there. And then uh, Naked and Afraid came about. <laughs> and so then I ended up on that show and that, that really was like, okay, that's the kicker. I really want to get into doing more of this and like continuing and, and, and starting to teach more other, uh, other people instead of me just doing it by myself. So that's crazy. How'd you get into uh, naked and afraid? So that's another joke uh, <laughs> along, that, that came along with a, a friend of mine, that special forces buddy, a special forces buddy of mine. He uh, he's, he's watching this show he calls me up. He's telling me about like the show where these people are naked. It's crazy. And then he says the then he says the kicker. Why don't more black people do stuff like this, right? So I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, come on, bro. I'm like, of course, you know, this that other. So we go back and forth. He's just he's just pushing my buttons. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to get off because it was like one alpha dog talking to another alpha dog. <laughs> so I got up. I got off the phone. I went online. I looked it up. I filled out an application thinking it would just be, you know, uh, something funny, you know, that I could say, hey, I did it. Look, nothing happened. I, I filled out this application. And sure enough, these people called me back and they said, we'd like you to come on the show. They put me through some paces. And um, and I was like, OK, I'm in it. I'm in it now. This is it. You know, so uh, that was that was pretty, pretty uh, fun story. So that friend, I just, I actually spent uh, time out on my property with him this uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday, and uh, he and I were um, uh, talking. And now I own sixty acres of land, and I teach people outdoor skills and stuff here in uh, North Carolina. And he was just like, "Could you imagine from that day when we had that conversation, and we were making, and I was making fun of you, and and uh, and challenging you that you would go from that." to on the show to because of the show, I ended up purchasing the land and doing all this stuff. And I mean, it really was, it was an amazing uh, turn of events. So who were you on the show with? I was on a show with a young lady named Phaedra and uh, she was a, a, you know, 
we had a tough time, but she was, you know, she was doing her best, the best that she could. And I was doing the best that I could. And, you know, when you're in a situation like that, it, it can bring out sides of you that you didn't even know were there. Um, which was, ha- which is actually what happened to me. There was some stuff that I thought, I had gotten rid of from my wartime, uh, but being out there naked with nothing and living off the land really exposed some of those things that I had buried. And so that's what led me to start my nonprofit, which is called the Soil Foundation, where I bought this property and, um, you know, I, I was able to, I'm able to do these outdoor classes. And our goal is to do retreats where people can kind of go off grid and kind of heal after a deployment and just, uh, you know, we don't have any cell phone signal out there. It's just go out there. It's, you know, it's about, um, it's, it's not about 40 minutes away from Bragg or 30 minutes away from Bragg. And, you know, you can come and hang out and spend the day or a weekend and let go of all that. Did you win? I didn't see that episode. Yeah. I made it all the way to the end. There's no, well, winning is bragging rights. Basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that's pretty damn awesome. What was the what was the toughest thing that you dealt with being on the show? The toughest thing I dealt with was the cold. It was it was uh, in the mid uh, mid to high thirties at night. Oh man! So if you can if you can imagine being completely naked on the side of the Himalayan mountains uh, in you know thirty degree weather with no clothes on, I mean it was just it was in it was intense. I mean that was really tough. Yeah, that. Dude, the cold and, and the fact that you're f-ing naked like that, that's awful. <laughs> like, screw that. What was the, what was the biggest lesson that you kind of took away and uh, like the biggest strength that you have now because of that experience? Um, that is, that's a great, great story. Um, so when I came back, I had a hard time reintegrating um, because – it was an awakening as to, and I still go back and forth with this. This is something I think most people have a challenge with. You know what? We really don't need much of anything as human beings. Um, We need food, water, shelter. And at some point we decide we want, and we need love, right? From other people. But other than that, I mean, we, we have all these things and we don't really need them. And that was, that was probably the biggest thing that I really, really got to know for sure out there. I mean, cause it wasn't even, to, even in the military, you know, you go overseas, you got, you know, I was, I was in PSYOP. So we had pretty good, pretty, really good equipment. Actually we had, you know, um, you know, things that we needed while we were over there. Um, and so it wasn't like, you know, I was stripped of everything. When you're a naked and afraid, you are stri- literally stripped of everything, you know, and you are just figuring it out. And it's in that time that I really recognize that, man, the majority of the things that I value or think that are important in life, actually, they're, they're just they're just illusions. Mm-hmm. You know, the things that are the most important are my family. The things that are most important is the fact that I can feed myself, drink some water and uh, keep myself warm at night or, you know, keep my temperature regulated. And that's it. Everything else I'm just putting I'm putting values on that don't even really matter. And so, um, yeah, that was my biggest lesson out there. Makes sense, man. What, uh, how did you overcome the cold? Um, I built a, well, first off we, we built a one shelter and then she was very sick. So she had to go away for, uh, well, not go away completely, but she was pretty not there for about four days. Um, and so while that time was, uh, going on, you know, I, we had a big argument over what's better. Uh, fire or shelter. Um, And I was like, look, you know, I've been in situations where I've been outdoors for, you know, survival training. And I know that it's very difficult to keep a fire going at night for 21 consecutive days in extreme cold and temperatures and weather that you're not really sure of. So I built a, uh, a a um, a shelter that was a debris hut. And it was like an A frame debris hut. And so I had debris on the outside of it to keep the water out. I had debris stuffed on the inside and I crawled in there and I just would not move. And uh, in a recent article that was written about me, I talk about like there was one drop of water that kept coming through <laughs> and it was drop, it was dripping on my shoulder. Oh. And that thing, that thing gives me nightmares to this day. But 
uh, that was how I stay warm. I, I basically did what animals did, you know, what animals do. You know, they can't make fires, but they can make shelters. They can make nests. And so I made a nest, a really good nest, and I just snuggled up in it. And eventually my partner came back and we realized that probably if we really want to make it and be comfortable and get some rest at night, we should probably build a shelter that incorporated a fire. So we built a new shelter and it had a fireplace on the side of it. And that's how we, uh, that's how we stay warm at night. Damn, that's pretty crazy. And you both finished, it's 30 days, right? 21. 21 days. Holy f***. Did you, did you ever just consider cutting open a tauntaun and sleeping inside that? You think they smell bad on the ins- on the outside? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Star Wars joke. Star Wars joke. What? He's a ninja, Nick. Shut the f*** up. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean. Um, Luke? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. I mean, I was a space ninja. Come yeah, on, they're they're like space wizard ninjas, that, sort of. That's true. That's true. Just use the force, Hakeem. Uh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you had Darth Vader, who was the samurai, and then you had yeah. you know the Jedi, who were the ninja. I mean, literally, that's that's kind of like the real deal. So you guys called that. <laughs> totally, one hundred percent. Guys, we're talking right. to Hakeem Isler. We're gonna talk about the other two TV shows that he was on and some other stuff when we take when we get back from taking this break and hearing from Second Call Defense. Now, for our Defensive Gun News of the Week, sponsored by Second Call Defense, offering you complete protection for armed self-defense. All right, Aaron, I'm, I, I was sorry to cut you off there, but, you know, Savage isn't here, and his one job on the ship is to tell me when 30 minutes is up and I have to do another ad read. Turns right. out we, we don't need him at all. <laughs> Yeah, dude, why is he even here? I don't even know. I don't know. We'll have to talk about this after the show. Uh, so second call defense, um, we were we had a really interesting discussion in our Patreon group uh, earlier this week, and it was a video of a dude kicking some grandma on a subway. And like, when 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 do you have the, the I don't know the responsibility, or when, when do you have the obligation to to confront and or use deadly force and things like that? And it was just a, it was a really interesting conversation, but. The one thing that I took away from it, um, or the biggest thing I took away from it, is that there's like so many differing opinions and different different things to take into account, like what happened before, what happened after, all this different stuff. And there's really no real answers. It's all gray area. And anytime that there's a gray area that can be used and abused for both both directions, whether they want to prosecute you or whether they don't want to prosecute you. And that's why second call defense is so important for me, because bottom line – I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail because I did what I thought was right and, and, you know, used my firearm for self-defense and they take care of that day one dollar one. Everything's covered up front. You never have to worry about paying for anything. They get you the attorneys, they pay the retainers, they pay damages, both civil and criminal. And you can find all of it at we like shooting.com slash SCD. So Aaron, what do we always say? If Captain Marvel can do it, why can't that dude? Sure. This portion of We Like Shooting has been sponsored by Second Call Defense, the most comprehensive protection for armed self-defense in America. Visit welikeshooting.com slash SCD to find out how to get your first month free. What were you saying, Aaron? I said if Captain Marvel can do it. <laughs> that is not what we always say. <laughs> no, we say well, don't wait till it's too late. Right. But you know what? No one like no one batted an eye when Captain Marvel beat the shit out of that old lady on the on that I movie. I mean, they actually <laughs> did because they showed it in a trailer and people freaked out and they had to go back and change the trailer. So did I, they really? I yeah, they it. did. Yeah, I don't even like those old ladies. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, you know, you, dude, she could have been up to no good. She, I mean, how do you know he's not defending himself? Exactly, one hundred percent. That that was a big problem. Yep. Yep. We're back with Hakeem Isler. Uh, we just talked about his time on the TV show Naked and Afraid, but Hakeem, that wasn't enough, man. You had to do it again. Naked and Afraid XL. What the hell was that? Yeah, that was a 40-day challenge in, in, the, in the jungles of Colombia. That, uh, that, was, that was intense. And so I went from extreme cold to extreme hot, and that was, uh, and that was tough. That was very tough. So. It, it, it seemed like it would be more buggy. Yeah, there was there was quite a bit of bugs out there, and um, you know that, and things that were were biting uh, in in very uncomfortable places. So, like you know, the back I, of a Volkswagen bug. Say that again. Like in the back of a Volkswagen bug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what he meant. Okay, so so forty days in Colombia. Did you have to go to rehab after? 
<laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't make it all the way to the end on the forty day challenge. Uh, okay. Now, do, you guys, do people like you know check each other out? You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, everyone's naked. I'm sure there's like a couple hot girls there. You're like, mm. yeah, I'm looking at it right now. You you might think that, but you know, I, I do actually think that. <laughs> I, I, I'm giving you confirmation because that's all Aaron would do. <laughs> yeah, he, he would, would freeze would and starve to death. <laughs> but uh, but my carnal knowledge would be filled. Yeah, <laughs> you'd be short lived in that in that mindset because it would just it would go away right real fast once you realize the magnitude of where what your situation is. You know, he'd, he'd throw his back out the first day because it'd be like sup. Sup, sup. <laughs> uh, it's so true. It's so true. But yeah, that dude, that's so much. So, uh, what what was the elimination for you on this one? So this one, I ended up getting uh, a crazy uh, cramps um, and spasms, and so they were telling me. One guy was saying, "Oh, you need to drink more water," and then uh, we were drinking water out of this river, um, and. You know, they didn't show any of that, which was, you know, it's fun editing. So it is what it is. But, um, you know, kept drinking it, kept drinking it, was still getting severe cramping and eventually realized that I may have flushed my system of electrolytes and things of that nature. Uh, we were sweating like crazy, but drinking like crazy. Um, and so ultimately I came home, got checked out by the doctors and uh, realized that, you know, my potassium levels were like super low, like extremely low and that it was, it was probably a good call, you know, or in their case, it, they said it was a good call, but, um, I was, I was becoming more of a hindrance to my team than I was helping them. And that was not what I, that wasn't working really well for me mentally. Is there, so. is there, is there no salt there? Jeremy asked if I mean, there's Columbia, Columbia, there'd be bananas. If you're what did he low, ask? Right? He's, <laughs> the, I have no idea what is going up with this going on with the stream, but it's, hilarious so he he said is, is there no salt there and then he said in Colombia, you would think that there would be like bananas and sources of potassium like that and stuff that is true that is true you would think but not where we were <laughs> so, so did you guys um, have to deal with any kandaroo there were some cacti there some cactus there but what did, what did you just say Can- the kandar- kandaroo kandaroo i don't know what that is i don't know fish that swims up your pee hole oh fish yeah that swims up your pee hole yeah oh the little swimming fish that little uh yeah, yeah the penis fish. it wasn't in the it wasn't in the stream that we were swimming in because I didn't have anything in my pee hole when I came in. <laughs> <laughs> it's the pee hole you had to worry about. <laughs> Either I, I worry about all of them. So when I when I saw Naked and Afraid XL, I thought it was all fat people, and I got my hopes Dude, up. Dude, I, I was like, like, I could do this. I can, yeah, I can do that. But, but apparently, it's just longer. So yeah, I probably can't do that. Yeah, honestly, guys, <laughs> I'm a never nude. So I, I can't <laughs> you guys, you guys would be not fat. Did it? Yeah, if we if we did it, we would lose some weight. That's for sure. That's true. Aaron and I did an episode of Naked and Afraid, but really we were just nude in his backyard. So I mean, it was <laughs> just, and then Sean ate a slug on accident. It was yeah, kind of funny. It, I was hungry. It had been seven <laughs> minutes since I'd eaten. Did you at least put salt on it first? No, no, no we didn't have salt. We were, we were in the in, in the wild, man. There's no salt. So there. I mean, you can mine salt from the wild. Come on, man. As if 21 days and then 40 days wasn't enough, you did another reality TV show called Kicking and Screaming. Tell us about that. So Kicking and Screaming was a cool show. Um, they took people who had no outdoor experience uh, and uh, and and li- literally lived in suburbs. They were. You know, some of them were actors, uh, some of them were etiquette coaches, you know, um, you know, people just who are so far removed from outdoor living. And we had the, and they took 10 survivalists and they paired a survivalist with one of these individuals and we had to uh, keep them alive and we had to like compete against each other and like these challenges. And it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting show. It was almost like Survivor, but you had real like survival instructors and, and people on there, you know. Uh, they had myself. They had another guy who was a uh, SEER instructor for the Air Force. They had another lady who was a SEER instructor, you know. So it was some pretty hardcore survival instructors, and uh, and and we were paired up with these people. My my partner was uh, Angelica Bridges, who was uh, uh, one of the Baywatch, um, you know, women. So nice. I was. Uh, she was a great partner, and we had a good time. Uh, but we didn't make it all the way to the end. I, I didn't win that $500,000. I'm a little sad about that. Damn, I'd be sad too. Did you at least get her naked and afraid? 
Negatron. Oh, damn it. <laughs> other show. Other show, Aaron. Well, you know, yeah. sometimes you just crossovers. <laughs> <laughs> any any girl that's naked around Aaron that's is afraid. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Not with enough for a hypno. Uh, okay, that'll do. That'll wow. do. That'll do. <laughs> I, I prefer them to be naked and very comfortable. <laughs> right. It's it's better for the lawsuits because second call defense doesn't cover that kind of thing. Aaron, just so you know, telling you for a friend. Uh, it's all right. I just offer more jello. Hakeem, so psychological warfare, uh, American Ninja, three separate reality shows, Naked and Afraid, Naked and Afraid XL, and uh, Kicking and Screaming, but also doing a lot of writing these days, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of writing. Tell uh, us about that. How'd you get into it? What kind of stuff do you write about? So, um, besides writing in like magazines, like I've written a few articles for Off Grid Magazine, and I've had some articles done about me. Uh, recently, Ballistic Magazine did an article about my blade that I had, uh, the Path Seeker that I designed. Um, it's an outdoor wilderness blade. And then um, I, uh, I'm writing two books right now. So one of them is called Ninja Survival, and it's a uh, survival book. Uh, but it talks about that, you know, some of the things that we were talking about earlier about what made ninja uh, their survival skills really, you know, amazing and what, what, what separates or what relates their survival to the way we see survival nowadays. And so um, – you know, I take it from that perspective. And then the business of survival is, um, you know, how do you, you know, from my perspective as a business owner, I own a business here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And, um, you know, how does the wilderness, what are the things that I've seen is a lot of the wilderness processes that you would go through for survival um, are things that you can use to help you grow your business. So the same skill sets that you need to be a survival instructor or survivalist are the same type of skills that you would need to actually be a successful business operator. So I, I relate those two skills and, and things of that nature. Yeah. I was actually, I was thinking that I was like, when you were talking about uh, ninja earlier, I was like, man, that's like everything that could benefit everything in life. Plus you could somebody up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's that, uh, so let's see, uh, off grid magazine, December, 2017, you wrote an article called the psyop way. Uh, can you summarize that one for us? Uh, the psyop way was just basically talking about different aspects of, uh, psyop and, um, how you would use those aspects of psyop as a means to, uh, stay alive in different environments. How do we look at things? Why did we look at things those ways? What were these, uh, you know, because like I said, it's all around your, your mindset. You know, you train your body, but your body really has everything in how your body uh, operates. It really has everything to do with your mind. You know, so if you really understand your mind, you can understand a multitude of things about yourself and how to make yourself successful in different environments. So, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, last fall, actually, in the Off Grid magazine, and this is actually a very interesting one, was the, an article called The Disaster of Denying Disaster. Uh, it's a, about that. It won't happen to me mindset. Can you kind of talk to us about that a little bit? Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's that's, uh, we are so far removed from being in a struggling, uh, a str struggling daily for life in the sense that, you know, my daughter thinks that struggling is when she doesn't have her cell phone, you know, but, um, you know, this idea of, struggling where I got to feed myself. I have to find water for myself. So what ends up happening is that uh, we see that there's disasters happening all around us. You know, you have uh, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy. We had Hurricane Matthew here in North Carolina. I mean, all these things are hitting us and doing major damage, flooding people's houses out where they don't have water. They can't get access to water or food. And still, when those things go away, it's like they never even happen. People still don't prepare. They still don't take uh, steps to prepare themselves for what could happen or what will happen. And so th there's this, this psychology that's going on, this psychology of denial where people are denying, even though it's happening, it's right there in their face. They still deny that it could happen to them and they hide from it, you know. And so instead of taking precautions to get ready for it and um, – and so that's what that article is really about. It really dives into some of the psychology that's going on there 
um, and some of the ways that people should be able to prepare and be ready for that. That's pretty cool. So uh, we're getting close to time, but what are some of those things that people can do to prepare? I mean, being a survivalist and clearly in Naked and Afraid and Naked and Afraid XL, 21 days and 40 days where you basically have nothing. Um, <laughs> clearly, that's like not the ideal situation and you want to be able to prepare a little bit ahead of time. What are some of those things that you think people can do and where should they kind of spend their focus? Like from a dude who has nothing, doesn't have any idea what to do, doesn't have a ton of money to spend, but just w- woke up this morning and said, you know what, I, I need to be more prepared should something happen. What's the, what's the advice you give him in the order of operation? So first thing, first thing I tell everybody when I'm teaching them is that so sometimes they say, well, water's more important, so you got to have water. Make sure you have water. But really, I say before that, what's stopping you? Why haven't you figure out why you hadn't taken the steps already? You know, because for whatever for everybody, that's different. Hey, I'm lazy. Oh, I just don't find enough time. Oh, it's not that important in my mind. Why is that? Because that's going to be the thing that when you start preparing, that's going to shut you down, and then you're just going to let everything fall by the wayside, and then you're going to stop. You know, a week or so down the line, or forget what you have, and and so on and so forth. And then secondly, you know, you just got to really start hammering out a plan. Okay, uh, what is the most common thing to happen in my diff- my particular area? Is it going to be a home invasion? Is it going to be a hurricane? Is it going to be an earthquake? Is it a flood? Like, what is it? And then I really need to start preparing for that. Okay, what? well, in the last flood, what happened? Well, people lost their, you know, clean water. So let me make sure I get some uh, clean water going on. You know, I can buy some bottles of water or things of that nature, have a plan on how to clean that water. Then beyond that, you got to, you know, think, well, I can live pretty long without food. So I'm going to have some decent food in the house, Um, you know, but, you know, how much do I need for me and my family to be comfortable? And then if people come looting or looking for my stuff, you know, what is my, what's my plan then? Do I have a backup plan on how we need to get out of here and where we need to go? Uh, in order to stay safe. Um, and do I know my neighbors? Have I communicated with my neighbors? Have I talked to them? Do I know if there are people that I can trust, people that I can use to help me to build a fortified survival situation? You know, all those things are things that are going to be very important to you um, when disaster comes. But first and foremost, it really has to do with you. What's stopping you from doing that already? Some people already have that built into them. They got everything they need. But the majority of the people don't. And so what's stopping them? What's making them believe that that's not important? And once they can figure out their why, you know, then they will start to really tap into uh, getting prepared. But, you know, in my book, that one of the things I'm talking about in my book, Ninja Survival, is that everybody already knows you're supposed to be prepared, right? You know, you tell people, hey, you should have 550 cord and you should have a fire starter and you should have this and blah, blah, blah. But still, hundreds of people go missing or get lost every year out in the woods and they don't have the things that they need. So then why is that? And then you hear stories like, oh, this kid was a Boy Scout or this person over here was a Girl Scout or, yeah, they did some stuff, you know, some hiking stuff. Well, why didn't they have what they need? Because they didn't think that it would happen to them, you know, Um, and then they just ended up in this bad situation and they didn't have any skill sets to deal with it. So, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Get the mental portion taken care of first. Like why, why, why the are you so lame? And then once you solve that problem, <laughs> you can actually move forward and solve problems. That, that does make a lot of sense. Like, honestly. Um, but yeah, just a little bit, writing a lot of articles in magazines and stuff like that. You you're writing another book. I, it looks like you have a book already. Um, get it back to the, the top here, but it's called modern hand to hand combat agent samurai, ancient samurai techniques on the battlefield and in the street. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. So modern hand to hand combat when I was, uh, my last deployment, um, as I was going through that, I started really making co- a correlation between. So, in our in our lineage of ninjutsu, we have like uh, four remaining ninja schools. We got nine lineages under our branch. We got four of them in ninjutsu schools. Deal a lot with espionage, psychology, things of that nature, and and fighting. And then we have some that are carryover from like samurai. Uh, schools and we learn a lot about how they used to fight in armor and and things of that nature well when i started looking at 
American warrior armor for the military, I was like, whoa, this is very similar to what I know of samurai armor. So there's a correlation here. You know, so if that's the case, um, right now in basic training on, at Fort Benning, I'm here doing jujitsu. And jujitsu is important. You know, it's good to know what happens if I go on the ground. I can build a good warrior spirit that way. Um, but what about when I have all my armor and stuff on, all my kit? And so the summer I had whole schools that died out and some in some traditions that's still around uh, that where they talked about how to fight in armor, how to move in armor, you know, and that was uh, and so I dive, I delved into that whole scenario of like, OK, well, what is what would this look like for an American military warrior wearing armor and, you know, wearing their full kit? And some people were pretending. Right. So some people I was around in the military were pretending they would put on like body armor with no plates or body armor with no magazines and no rifle and no pistol and no, you know, no helmet. You know, and so yeah. it was like it was like that's pretending, you know, that's that's us playing Dungeons and Dragons again, which is cool, but it's not what, what's going to save us. You know, so we need to really understand, OK, when I kick in this door and somebody grabs me from the side. Um, and you know, my, my teammates have to clear their sector of the room. Um, I better be strong enough to hold my own and I need to know and understand how to move in this body, this body armor against somebody who's a lot lighter and faster than me because they don't have that armor on. Um, and so I better be able to fight and stay on my feet and do what I need to do. And so I designed that, I wrote, I wrote that book around using that ancient, that ancient knowledge as a way to like really, uh, enhance our modern day techniques very cool man uh knife maker was one of the things that i mentioned at the beginning of the show you've got the pathfinder right path seeker path seeker sorry yeah Mm -hmm. tell us about it so the path seeker is my outdoor blade and so um one of the things that happened when i got back was i designed an axe that i used on naked and afraid called the tengu and um that Tengu is really awesome. But I also wanted to have a blade that was easier to manufacture. And so I started looking at what would that be like for a person um, to carry. Um, and I started and I created the Path Seeker. And the Path Seeker, its name is that because the ninja were all about, you know, finding uh, a better path, a better way. Um, and so in my own life, I'm always living that. As a matter of fact, the term ninja means one who endures, one who perseveres. That's actually what it means. So, you know, and all of us are ninja in our own way, because in each life, we're all dealing with our own challenges and trying to make things and trying to overcome our different challenges. And so the path seeker kind of embodies that idea of uh, how can I overcome these different challenges in my life? Um, and, and find my way. And, and it's, it's a blade that symbolizes, you know, helping people find their way. That's pretty cool. So uh, let's see, it looks like overall length is a little bit under a foot. So 11 and a quarter inches, a uh, six inch blade. I was, I was looking at it. It kind of reminds me of like the, we've been talking about these a lot lately, it seems, but like the, the Rambo kind of knife of, uh, <laughs> you know, the, from the eighties and nineties and stuff like that. It's kind of like the modern equivalent of that. It doesn't have all the like survival stuff, but it's just that, that big, that, you know, that, that big, good blade that just can solve a lot of problems for a person. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was what I was going for. I was going for something that wouldn't break. Um, I was going something for something that, uh, wouldn't fatigue the hand if I was chopping, uh, that could do some heavy duty work, but then also do some light work, um, some fine work, something that, you know, can hold the edge, uh, and allow me to use, you know, to, to start fires and things of that with my ferrocidium rod without, you know, dulling my blade. Um, and that's why I put the striker on the back, um, something I could baton with. And so the path seeker really serves a lot of functions um, in its design. And that was really that was really one of the things that I was going for when I was designing it. And so Double Star was gracious enough to pick it up, Double Star Corporation. Um, and Double Star is a, you know, they used to manufacture or they still manufacture and make guns. You know, they're really good, you know, a really big manufacturer there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they moved over into wanting to do uh, blades um, a few years ago. And uh, one of my 
a friend of mine actually uh, uh, works there. And so he and I got to talk and, and that's how they picked up the blade. Very cool, man. That, that's pretty damn awesome as well. Uh, let's see. We've covered so freaking much. It's like, I'm trying to just think back to see the things that I may have missed. Um, we talked about the foundation a bit. We talked about the knives. We talked about the magazines. We talked about being a ninja psyops. We talked about the reality shows. <laughs> and what I really realized is that I think you came on the show just to make us feel bad about our <laughs> little lives. <laughs> Cause like, I'm like, yeah, I had uh, several drinks of Jack Daniels today, but that's pretty much all I accomplished. <laughs> And Nick, he was drunk when he got here, so hmm. which you never know. I don't know. He That's... plays it off really well. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, I've I've just gotten really good at it. No, officer, I haven't had any drinks <laughs> okay. today. Okay, <laughs> that that'll definitely do. But man, just it sounds like you're doing a lot of really really cool stuff. Are you having fun? Yes, yes, I'm having a lot of fun. I'll be speaking in Las Las Vegas at the Martial Arts Super Show, and. um I'll be out there with like people like Chuck Norris and, you know, and, and I'm like really excited about that because, you know, I'm, I'm this little guy, um, you know, a young kid from New Jersey who had this dream of being a ninja and, uh, went out there and followed it. And, and, uh, now I'm out here helping people. And so a lot of people know ninja as assassins, you know, they say, Oh, they were the assassins and they dressed up in black and stuff. But, uh, really, one of the things that I, if, if I was to leave anything out there that I'm really trying to push out there is that the ninja were all about their community. And so um, they were trying to have their community thrive and survive. And they had a, an overwhelming force that was trying to shut that down. And even then, a lot of their tactics were designed around, OK, I could kill one person or I can kill we can go to war and try to fight off hundreds and thousands. So maybe we just take out this one person and then I save a bunch of people on their side. I save a bunch of people on our side and then we go there, Um, you know, so that now no one has to fight. And so there are all these different things. Now, nowadays we're not doing that, but we can uh, use the knowledge and the skill sets that the ninja passed down through generations to empower people. So I spent a, a good majority of my day teaching youth, kids, and adults, but I really like teaching the kids. And some people say, well, that's, that's a cop out. You know, you're, this, you're supposed to be this guy that, you know, teaches. And I have some pretty intense classes with the adults, but I like teaching the kids because you don't know they have so much potential. And if you can't teach a child to do stuff, to defend themselves, to grow strong, to be powerful, then, you know, then, you know, teaching an adult is a cop out because adults are kind of easy. You know, they understand what's going on. They had the experience. They, they've lived through some of those challenges, but teaching children is, is uh, a passion of mine. And so um, to go from this little kid that was a wide eyed ninja myself, want to want to be ninja to now training little kids that are want to be ninja is just kind of a cool, kind of a cool thing. That's freaking awesome. Hey, hey Sean. Yeah. Jeremy. At- Ask him if he uh, knows where the the black clad ninja stereotype came from. Okay, uh, Hakeem, Jeremy would like me to ask you if you know where like the black clad uh, ninja ninja stereotype came from. Oh yeah, so there's several different. So there's several different stories with that. You know, when it comes down to this historical stuff, a lot of legends and things of that nature. One one common uh, story was that um, there it comes from like the the theater that uh that was back in japan during the time so when you they didn't have like they didn't they didn't have like curtains and things of that nature like a big production we would have today so whenever the scenes would switch people with black would come onto the stage and move the scene around change chairs move chairs move tables and what happened is over time people just got so used to seeing that happen that they kind of didn't even they cut those people kind of went invisible. They weren't, they didn't pay attention to those stage, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you call them, coordinators or whatever. Um, Thespians. Say that again. <laughs> I, I don't know. I know what you're talking about though. Yeah. The, the Kabuka. No, no. It's like the people who were kind of in the background and they were, they were like, stage. no, it's like, like stage hands. Yeah. They were like stage hands, but they, wait, wait, they, Sean, you said no. So shut up. <laughs> I just, yes, I disagree with, with you, me. Aaron. Jeremy, <laughs> 
I mean, that's all that matters. Aaron, I'm trying to listen to Hakeem. That would be it, like stagehands, you know, yeah. and so those guys disappeared. So the the concept of you had this character that nobody that that was so common and that was so in your face that nobody really saw anymore. You know, you were so uh, low on the totem pole. Maybe you're a poor peasant. So nobody really takes, you know, note of you. Nowadays we call it the gray man, right? The person who yeah. just blends in and nobody knows who it is um, that people don't even see you. And so this idea is how like the birth of like this black outfit was uh, designed, you know, came about. But there's another story, um, and I'll leave you with that. This one is not as known. So um, the idea is that if you are a light, right, let's say you're a bright light on a porch and you turn that, blight, that bright light on at night in the summertime, what's going to happen? Uh, the bugs will come to it? Yep. A bunch of bugs are going to come to it, right? So, but if you if you either use like a red light or a really dim, darker light, it will attract less bugs, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea was that the black outfit was a way to symbolize that um, you have this character who's really bright on the inside. But if I'm too bright and people, people will see that brightness, the enemy sees that brightness, whatever your enemy is, and then they will, they will come to you, they will attack you. So what you do is you shroud that brightness in this kind of like black uh, you know, this very, this, this, this color that absorbs that light so that therefore you kind of blend in and you're un- you go unseen. And I mean, if you think about our tactical folks, you know, we're looking for this camouflage to help us blend in and go unseen, uh, so that you have this warrior that's there for the good of our country to do this thing. And, um, they wear this type of unit. So they need to do. Uh, unhindered, you know? Um, and so, you know, that was, that's kind of another story that goes into the black uniform of the ninja is that you had this, this person who was like this mountain mystic warrior, um, you know, turned into a protector for his community um, that people wanted to find and kill. And he would kind of dress him, he would, you know, emotionally and mentally and physically kind of dress itself in this kind of black garb to make itself invisible uh, to danger and then hide amongst the people um, in a way that they didn't even know he was there, just like those stagehands, you know, in Kabuki theater. So yeah. Um, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so the takeaway here is that if you want to make sure that you are safe from ninjas, you just hang a bug zapper out in front of your house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that is it. <laughs> That's exactly it. You hit it right on the notes. Awesome. Okay, so I wrote down some notes of, of the literally the last stuff that I wanted to ask you before I let you go. Uh, what is your blade weapon? Blade uh, bladed weapon of choice. My bladed weapon of choice. Is this like a traditional weapon or a modern weapon? Uh, you just you, a you bladed choose. one. Yeah, a bladed weapon. Um, I tend to really enjoy uh, any type of double-sided blade. Um, I really like double-sided blades because I don't have to think about what side I need to do damage with. And I'm more of a stabber than I am a slicer anyway. But, you know, if, if anything, I love double-sided blades. All right. Uh, but, you know, if I'm doing outdoor wilderness stuff, I'm down with the one side, one sided like – I'm down with the pass here. Exactly. I was going to say, yeah. So that's, you, a shame, that's a shameless plug. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, double-sided blade versus AR-15, which, which would you rather have? I would definitely go with the AR-15 <laughs> <laughs> because that's right up my ninja alley. I don't even have to be close to this guy. Yes. That's work. More efficiency. <laughs> I, I, I love it. So Bruce Lee, uh, he carried. I was actually just in a blade tactics class with two lamb from Ronin Tactics uh, Saturday. Okay. Saturday. And he talked. He was talking about, you know, he's like, look, man, even Bruce Lee carried a gun. Uh, do you kind of agree with that concept? Yeah, I actually, and and that gentleman is actually from here. He's from Fayetteville, I believe, uh, or Fort Bragg. He was stationed here for a while. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, I am. Me and my me and my partner, we are my friend. He he and I debate on this a lot. He is. Uh, He's uh, a, a retired. He just retired two years ago from SF Third Group, and um, 
every time we go out, we'll go to like a Starbucks or something and we'll be chatting and he'll ask me, he'll say, are you carrying right now? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer is no. And he's always like, well, he always gets on me and we always go back. And I mean, this is all the time. We go through this every single time. He's like, well, you're definitely a lot. You're not a sheepdog if you don't have your blade. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you just wanted a sheep right now. And I'm like, yeah, OK, that's that's one way to think of it. Actually, I, I like uh, both mindsets because I'm challenging myself. I never want to get so comfortable that I think anytime I have a pistol on me, I have the answer. So sometimes I have to force myself as a ninja to think outside of the box. So I won't carry. I won't carry because that forces me to say, okay, well, now that I'm not carrying, I'm going to, if something was to pop off right this moment, I have to think of a new way to deal with that. I think it keeps me pretty sharp because now I'm always thinking about, what do I need to do? What are the things that I need to do when I walk into a place to actually keep me and my family safe if I don't have a gun? If I go somewhere where they say, you can't have your gun here, we don't want you to have your gun here. I can fight that. I can go and lock my gun up in the car. And if I go and lock my gun up in the car, I'm going to feel absolutely naked because I don't have, I've never, I don't walk like that. Like my friend, anytime he goes somewhere and they tell him to get his gun, one of the most comments that he says to me is, I feel naked right now. I don't have my pistol. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, now you know why I've been training on and off like that forever. Sometimes I carry the gun. Sometimes I don't, you know, so I'm a proponent of keeping yourself safe. And if you, if you want that gun, have that gun. Um, But I also want, when I talk to people about my philosophy, I also say challenge yourself to think outside of the box because you don't want the bad guy to catch you off guard. There's no there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have to win. So if somebody tells you you can't carry in a certain place, you don't ever want to be feeling without. You want to be able to say, okay, I've been here. I know that. I trained for this, you know? Yeah. What uh, When you when you do carry, what's your, what's your favorite uh, carry gun? Glock. I got a Glock nine millimeter. Nice. Glock nineteen. Love it, man. Yep. All right. And then I just had some advice for you because I mean you've done a pretty good job of like promoting yourself and uh building the legend of ha- Hakeem Isler. Uh but I was gonna say you're gonna be with uh, with Chuck Norris. Can you imagine the fing headlines if you take out Chuck Norris? <laughs> no, I mean seriously, like uh, the headline probably w- won't be uh aging uh frail Chuck Norris taken out by up and coming modern survivalist the Black MacGyver. It'll be, you know, Chuck Norris taken out by the Black MacGyver. And I think that that's a huge thing for you. So just think about it. You don't have to answer right now, but uh, just something to consider. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's really cool. But I have, a, I have an even better one. <laughs> okay. so that, because if I take Chuck Norris out, I'll make all types of enemies, right? True, true. So, so some people will love me and they'll say, dude, that dude just took out Chuck Norris. A whole nother population will say – oh, man, that dude uh, took out Chuck Norris. We need to take him out, right? <laughs> but if I poison him and then I somehow magically, you know, get over him, I do some wiggle my fingers a bunch, slip him the antidote, and then I save him, then I'm the guy who saved Chuck Norris. And psychological warrior right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's that's a mic drop. Because rather, now I'd the people who love Chuck Norris is going to love me and the people who... Exactly. What did you say, Jeremy? I said I'd rather be known as the guy who killed Chuck Norris. <laughs> Hakeem Jeremy said that he'd rather be known as the guy who took out Chuck Norris. <laughs> we all know that what he actually means is he'd rather be known as the guy who f***ed off uh, Chuck Norris. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Uh, I mean, uh, Jeremy was a Marine. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, all right. You know, you know what's funny here? It's like you guys were dating at one point, and now you guys don't talk. Tell Jeremy. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's so great. It, like, I, I can't even fathom what kind of technological horrible thing has happened to allow that, because we can hear Jeremy uh, in Colorado. Aaron can hear Jeremy in Michigan, but Hakeem in uh, Fayetteville cannot hear Jeremy at all. It's like one of the most amazing things that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually one of the most funny things I've ever seen. I know. Me too. Well, so. Well, now that you said he was a Marine, I mean, it all makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hakeem. I'm, I'm, Ar- I'm Army with a lot of Marine buddies, but we always say uh, we don't want to hear them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, man. Hakeem, it's been awesome. Where can people find out more just and keep up with all the great stuff you're doing? Um, I got two sites that I would like to pass on to them. My main website, which is Hakeem Dash Isler, I S L E R. My first name is spelled H A. K-I-M is in Mary, 
dash isler i s l e r dot com. Um, they can find out about a lot of the different things that I'm involved in there. Um, and then also, you know, my Facebook, uh, Hakeem the Black MacGyver Isler. Um, that's a that's a common one. I always post there. And then actually, the last thing would be the Soil Foundation dot org. And if they want to. Uh, help support the Soil Foundation for us to uh, have more free wilderness retreats and things of that nature. That would be great. Or if they just want to see what I'm doing and whenever I have a class, get involved or something like that. So it's thesoilfoundation.org. Um, between those those three sites, you know, that that's the best way to get a hold of me. Freaking awesome, man. Uh, thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. I don't know if you got to run or if you can stick around. I do have to run. Um, I got got some things that I still have to finish tonight, but I really appreciate you guys tremendously for hearing me out, giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, hopefully I'll meet you guys at either Shots Show or Blade Show or something like that. So We're, we're everywhere, man. Just uh, look for the tallest dude and the smelliest dude, and you'll find Aaron and Jeremy. <laughs> you. Well, no, I, Jeremy, I meant that you're both tall and smelly, and Aaron, Aaron's just hanging out. <laughs> Hakeem Isler, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. All right, guys. It is it is time. We'll get further into the show. Well, Aaron, I'm, I'm already thinking of titles for the show. I've got so many. I can't wait to tell you at the can, very end. Can 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 we call Savage the Kami uh, MacGyver? Mm, yeah, actually, I, th- I think that we can without question. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it needs to be it needs to you know the title needs to be thrown around us as well, dude. I, I seriously I have no idea like what technological quirk allowed him not to hear Jeremy at all, but it's hilarious. I think he's doing it, it on purpose. It's that annoying. <laughs> I know it's so great. I love it. I was like I had questions. I'm like I'm not even bothering. I know, I know, man. It's a it's a f-ing disaster, but you know it's not a disaster. The Patriot Patch Company, and it is. I thought you were going to say your life. No, it is. Uh, it is time to talk about the giveaway segment brought to you by the Patriot Patch Company. Go check them out. PatriotPatch.co. Coupon code WLS gives you 10% off. We got five giveaways. The count them. One, two, three, four, five going on right now. And uh, they are the Patriot Patch Company Mega Monthly Giveaway. The Kanaz Tactical Group gives away class. Black Rhino Concealment gives away a holster. Stug Not Custom gives away a $50 gift card. They're the official sticker supplier of We Like Shooting. And Blue Alpha Gear gives away one belt system per month. And Aaron... It's time to actually give out the the, the awards and the, the prizes tonight, right? Yeah, I'm so excited. I am too. I was like, our audience is pumped. They are f-ing pumped. Uh, first Ooh. off, guys, if you want to join, go to welikeshooting.com slash giveaway. And you can also uh, – uh, sorry, I was reading uh, YouTube comments. Uh, <laughs> that's where you enter to win, but if you're a Patreon, you get extra entries. So you can enter to win every day manually, and you get extra entries for being a Patreon every single month. So – uh, the winner of the Canals Tactical Group class this month is Alex Waltman. Congratulations. There's applause for you. Stop it. Uh, Black Rhino Concealment, the winner this month is Matt Hopkins. There you go. Uh, cut it out. Okay. And uh, Stuck Not Customs, the winner this month is Chris Gillespie. Is this shtick getting old yet where I cut out the, the yeah. applause? Yeah. I just wish it would die down and Please. not just cut out. <laughs> Please keep it going. Okay. I can do that too. Here. Hold on. Uh, so let's see. The winner of the Blue Alpha Gear belt system and i just spent time at blue alpha gear was awesome is uh gregory lawless yeah congratulations there that's really cool for you it's like, it's like gregory lol <laughs> dude it is that's actually i thought i was like gregory lol 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 <laughs> <laughs> which also happens to be the wi-fi password here at the office <laughs> I, was gonna say, I was gonna say that but i didn't want to give it out you know it's fine what do i care um let's see and last but not least the winners of the patriot patch company mega monthly giveaway are Mike Meshalini, Kenneth George, Bobby DeLong, Mark Steinecker, Brad Reynolds, AJ Stone, Nick Ash, Austin Hodges, Andrew Sivert, Lynn Dicktel. Uh, who did your Dicktel? Uh, Nick Landers, Nicholas Oldenburg, Jeffrey Haddix, Kenneth Jesto, Jameson Nethery, Kevin Reithel, Larry Cunningham, Alex Waltman, Joseph Wider, James Smith. For the first f-ing time in the history of everything, Aaron, you have not selected duplicate people. I went over it twice just to make sure. Yeah. That just happened, folks. Can, you get a patch for that. You should. You should. You're not going to, but you absolutely should. So don't forget, we like shooting.com slash giveaway. And guys, we have this other show. It's called Double Tap. And on this Double Tap, 
every single Wednesday night when we record it and every Saturday when it comes out, we talk about things called not guns. And it's just a segment where we talk about, well, yeah, you guessed it, not guns. Uh, what did we talk about last week, Aaron? Uh, flying animals. Mm. Mm. Which which animal would we most fear would grow wings and fly? Sorry, I was drinking whiskey and I couldn't talk. Yeah, and most uh, I think most of us chose cats, actually. Yeah, cats, man. Yeah. That would be just horrifyingly scary. Yeah, I, I don't even like cats that can walk. <laughs> That's not true. No, I actually like Nick's cat a lot. I, I liked your cat Nick's, until you killed it. I think you like the cat more than I like the cat. Yeah, well, the cat likes me more than it likes you as well. Hmm. No, yeah, the cat runs from you, but it comes to me willingly. Yep, it comes for you. Also, it loves peanut butter, but that's a that's a story <laughs> for a different night. <laughs> I was oh, gonna say, oh. I thought you came for the cat. <laughs> All right, that's just well, it's going on there. Look, look. <laughs> right. If you haven't already, go subscribe to the show. We like shooting dot com slash show. You can subscribe at all the different places: iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, iTunes, everything else in the universe. And uh, guys, let's talk about some gear. And that's in our gear chat segment, stuff that you have, stuff that you need, and stuff that you want. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but Nick and I have actually been spending a ton of time at the range uh, every single week. Our big thing for 2019 is getting back to video content and video reviews and stuff like that. So we've been uh, really focused hard on doing that. And we couldn't do it without the support of Aaron, who edits all of our videos and does all that stuff. Uh, So the procedure and process basically is wake up. uh, In fact, we're going to do it tomorrow morning. Uh, I wake up at about 7 all right. I, I'm sorry. I wake up at 6:30. I get. I leave the house. Uh, get to the office around seven. Get everything set up uh, as far as the the stuff here goes. Nick stays at the house and uh, gets all of the targets and everything else ready. I meet our cameraman Steve at the office at about 8:30, and then we drive to the house, pick up all the targets and Nick and everything, and then we go to the range. We spend an entire day there. Come home, upload all the files. Usually between five and ten videos that we have recorded that day. And then over the next week, Aaron edits them. So our goal is actually to put out a a review or a video or just something funny every single weekday. And uh, I think we're, I think we're in pretty good shape. We're doing, we're doing pretty good. We did uh, three last week and the goal is five this week. So we're working hard, but one of the things that we did in a video that's going to come out very soon is painting with guns, which was actually pretty cool. Yeah, it was. Uh, Basically, we set up a bunch of canvases and put paint in the center of them and then shot through the canvas into the paint. The paint splashed and exploded all over the canvases. What was the, the most interesting one for you, Nick? Um, I, I think actually the uh, Tannerite one. <laughs> yeah, okay. That was, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, I'm trying to think. So we shot it with 22 LR. We shot it with 9 millimeter from a high point carbine. Uh, we used the thumb operated receiver, the Tor from Iron Horse Firearms for one of them, 223. Then we used 300 Blackout. And then we decided to blow shit up because, you know, mm-hmm. that's what we do. Um, but it was actually very cool. And one of the things we've been doing is shooting a lot of the Bowers suppressors uh, that, that we got a while back. And Bowers is a, a, an advertiser of We Like Shooting, BowersGroup.com. But the Bowers Group cans, man, they're super, super good. Uh, we shot the Biddy, which is just like a freaking, like a tiny ass little suppressor. I'm holding my fingers up to the screen. But I, three inches. Uh, yeah. A little over three like inches, that. something like that. So double the size of Aaron's. Oh, dude. It's, it, it's true. Unless it's cold out, then we're all. <laughs> or actually no one's. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but the biddy was freaking awesome. It was super quiet and the profile is like so small that it actually looks like part of the barrel. But then we've also been shooting the verse 458, which is also awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, dude, 458 Bushmaster. I'm sorry. 458 SOCOM and 450 Bushmaster out of a suppressor and literally doesn't make you cringe at all. Doesn't make your ears even twinge the least bit. Doesn't make them ring. Doesn't do anything that that's a f-ing win for me. So definitely go check out Bowers group. And we've been having a lot of fun doing these videos. Keep an eye out for the painting with guns videos. And uh, if you're looking for a can or a suppressor or something like that, definitely give Bowers group a look. They are, uh, we are all super impressed. I know Jeremy's been really impressed with the ones that he's got. In- have you, have you noticed the recoil reduction with the 458 verse? You know, I haven't paid that much attention. But... I've actually never shot my 450 Bushmaster without the can. Now, now we need to shoot with and without. Mm-hmm. We need to figure out a way to measure that. I, I'm working on that. I know you are. I was. I, was... I mean, it, it, it's not hard to do. So I've actually got a table, and I've got a. Oh, f- you know what? I actually did. I built this already. I've, I've got a table in the garage. It's got wooden rails 
on it. It's a folding table. Uh, I've got a cart that I put wheels on and then it's got inside of that, that cart with wheels. It's actually got a, a sled, a, a sled that you, um, put the gun in, strap the gun down. Then you pull the trigger remotely, which is the part that I haven't built yet. And then based on how much it pushes it back, we have a recoil number. I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's like, doesn't matter. We're not measuring weight or anything like that, but we're like, Hey, uh, uh, 223 goes back, you know, X number of inches. 450 Bushmaster goes back 12 number or, you know, 12 inches or whatever it happens to be. So that's a reasonable way to, to, yeah, measure. we were going to use mean, a, uh, like a scale that I have here. Like a, where, yeah, it's a fish scale kind of thing. Right. Cause it will hold the weight at the last, the heaviest point it had pulled. Mm-hmm. I mean, a really, really cheap and easy way to do that would just be to have a grid and shoot the gun in front of a grid and measure how no, that's, high it well, that, flips uh, I'm up talking and about how much felt, it travels back. Yeah, it's felt recoil for that. But yeah, and I actually have in the garage, I have a grid, mm-hmm. uh, one-inch squares on a big poster board that we can put behind anything and measure. Uh, well, I, I have a guy building the uh, recoil. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be used for ch- testing out brakes and uh, you know just to see what kind of muzzle device will mitigate uh, muzzle, uh, gun rise. Hmm, very cool. All right. So yeah. it looks like we have some stuff ahead of us. Aaron, what's your product you want to talk about tonight? Dude, I want to talk about the Jericho, the Jericho F. Uh, I like this gun. I, I love the Jerichos. I think they're sexy looking firearms. I think they're re- – I don't have one. But um, they're reasonably priced, about 400 or 550 bucks. Um the only thing I don't care about the Jericho is this double action only. So that's the one thing I, I no. don't care for. They're double action, single action. No. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. I, the link that I have right here. Uh huh. Yeah, that we're looking at right now. Yeah, that that link is wrong. <laughs> it says double action only. Yeah, that that link I assure you is wrong. One hundred percent assurance. Um, one hundred percent. I've I've worked on dozens of these and i've the never seen a double F. action only one okay well then that then my only complaint is uh is uh satiated so it must be it's a 10 10 out of 10 for you then yeah i really dude i love this gun it's a it's a good looking gun and i think uh i'm gonna i'm gonna try to get one this year so this is a it's a 10 plus one though is it no no it's actually a 16 plus one but <laughs> I know it's another thing that's wrong on here. Uh, I checked it out. Uh, they have it listed ten plus one because of uh, state restrictions for certain states. Oh, I see. Okay, oh, so you, it does come with a sixteen plus one. This uh, the the page also lists it as a polymer frame. Is this one of the polymer framed ones, or is it the uh, steel framed? This version? one, I believe, is the it's the F uh, nine ten, not the nine forty. So I think the F nine ten is a uh, is a polymer framed. All right. Uh-huh. So yeah, the F nine ten is. It, it, that's probably because there's a state where you can't have polymer frame guns. So I guess this would be the opposite, but okay. Yeah. Here's the one for 16 plus one, the Jericho F nine. And that, that also says double action only, but God, that photo, that photo looks an awful lot like metal, not polymer. And the description actually says single action function. This thing is all over the place. Yeah. I'm so confused. Right. But anyway, the, so I will say that I have held these. I'm pretty sure I've shot them and that mm-hmm. if they are the ones I'm thinking of, I, I, I dug the way they felt. I think this is the description for the uh, 941 and not the 910. Because if you look at the bottom, it says each Jericho 941 comes with two standard capacity magazines. Yeah. Or two 10 round magazines for consumers who reside in states with magazine capacity restrictions. So I think they just put the wrong information in the uh, description. Yeah, it could be, but... All in all, Jeremy, have you ever shot a Jericho? No. Do you want to? I mean, I would if somebody handed me one, but I'm not going to go like search it out. Oh, how do you what feel do you- about the oh. Israeli guns, Jeremy? I don't mind them. All right, fantastic conversation. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? I mean, Aaron? What, do you to, what do you want me to fucking say? Talk for five minutes and say nothing like the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> I'm not doing that. Uh, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I liked it better when the guests couldn't hear you at all. So I, <laughs> I, I like the, uh, the Jericho nine forty and 41. Um, I have seen a very large number of issues with them, which is strange to me. It also seems like a lot of the people who own them, uh, are like the people who very rarely shoot. And a lot of them would come in and be like, I've had this gun for 10 years and it's never worked right. Can you fix it? Um, 
I, I do like them though. Like I, I like the way they shoot aesthetically. They're very attractive. Um, the, the steel frame, they're a, uh, what? what you... Someone said, what watch are you rocking? Oh. I told him Walmart. It, well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a cheap one. It's an Invicta. Um, so, uh, there, I got completely derailed here. Uh, they're a CZ clone. The, the steel frame helps with recoil a lot, which is, is very nice and makes them pleasant to shoot. Also, Sean, one of these days, if you ever get around to watching Cowboy Bebop, the main character's uh, firearm of choice is a uh, Jericho, which, you know, makes them that much cooler. Very cool. Plus, uh, IWI is my Hebrews, you know what I'm saying? They are. They are. Uh, 549 retail, or actually not 549, 549 on Brownells, uh, but they are back ordered and out of stock. So, yes, they are. But yeah. you know what? It's worth the wait, I really do believe. If you're looking for a sexy handgun, I think this this fits the bill. Yeah, they're interesting. Uh Nick, tell us about your pork sword. My pork sword? Do you guys want to hear about my pork sword? Mm-hmm. All right. uh, has Jeremy seen it yet? <laughs> it's his uh, maybe. contact photo for Nick. Um, <laughs> so uh, I wish this was my pork sword. Uh, Black Collar Arms has announced their new chassis, which is called the Pork Sword. Um, this is a chassis for the Remington 700 pistol that was recently announced. Oh, yeah, that thing that all of us were like that thing except me i was like that's pretty cool yeah um except for the price the price is insane so uh they've announced this chassis it's got a little picatinny rail at the back so you can put an sb tactical brace on there um it's all skeletonized it looks really cool and it's set up so it'll take either a left or right-handed action which is also kind of nice uses the aics mags of course um MSRP is two ninety nine ninety nine, so three three hundred bucks. That's that's not too bad for a chassis. That's right in the right territory. You know, I saw um, that price, Nick. But if you look down lower, they have uh, another price there. Uh, the The pork sword chassis kit is available for six hundred sixty four dollars. Yeah, so that's the next thing. That's that's a kit. Um, okay. So so they actually have a kit that's available, which is a barrel. A uh, receiver, or uh, not a receiver, a barrel, a chassis, a grip, and an arm brace, um, and that's that that six hundred dollar price point. They have three calibers, and I think it was two barrel lengths to choose from. So if you happen to have a, a Remington seven hundred a hundred action laying around, or if you want to go buy one, they're like three hundred bucks new. Um, you can buy a, a three hundred dollar action buy this kit. Um, it's set up with a barrel nut, like a Savage. So you're able to install that barrel yourself at home and you can get set up with an, uh, a bolt action pistol for under a thousand dollars where the Remington one was what? 1500, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so it's actually a pretty cool, like DIY, relatively cost effective way to set up a, a bolt action pistol. If you want one, I mean, you still need the, uh, the, the gun or the uh, chassis, it's not the chassis, the, the receiver, gun. right? Right. That, that receiver is, would still come in under that thousand dollar price point. So I, I'm looking at this and I, I, I can understand 300 blackout and 458, but the 300 wind mag, I'm just not sure. Uh, it it doesn't say anything about barrel or what's that? It doesn't say anything about 300 wind mag. Uh, they oh, have, sorry, three, 308. They have 308, um, 300 blackout and 458. So come. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see a 308 in the 6.5 inch barrel configuration be a good idea. Yeah, I, I probably personally wouldn't buy one of those, but you know, um, certainly doesn't hurt to make them available. I probably wouldn't buy any of those in that barrel length, but <laughs> uh, but like a 12 and a half inch 300 blackout with a can on the end of it would be a lot of fun to go shoot stuff with. I can see that if you're, I could see that if you're like a bush pilot in Alaska. Yeah, and you just kept that in the case behind the seat of the plane and if you crash landed like that's what you got or if you're a rancher and you want something really compact that you can pop a coyote with at a few hundred yards um or or if you just want something that's kind of badass that you can fool around with um but what do you think about accuracy and not being able to bed bed that barrel though uh well you shouldn't bed the barrel the barrel should be free floated um but you totally can bed the action um, people bed actions and chassis all the time. True statement. Uh, when Nick looked over at me and was like, 
looking to me for confirmation of how much something costs, and I wasn't paying any attention at all, and I was just all. <laughs> That's a thing that happened. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? This Now the Remington 700 pistol is something that I would actually care about. So this is pretty damn cool. And you said like what six sixty four ninety three? Uh, yeah, it's right around six hundred bucks for the whole kit. And then if you just want the chassis, it's like three hundred. Very interesting. I dig it. Uh, so Jeremy, mm. you haven't talked a whole lot this episode because the guests couldn't hear you. But I have some questions for you. How's the range going? Oh well. Uh... So I had to close down the last two Saturdays because the township was being uh, Sundays. Sunday on Sundays, I had to close down the last two Sundays. Yeah. Um, but my we got to talk to a lawyer, showed him all the everything, and it's a zoning thing, and we showed him all the zoning paperwork, and she's like, ah, I don't think they have the power to do this. I'm going to write him a letter. So she wrote him a letter that you know basically told them uh, no in a lot nicer words than I would have. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, so we sent that to him and we're waiting for a reply, which they probably won't reply to. Um, but when we were asking for like, Hey, can you send us like the complaints? Like, can we see the complaints to see if they're like valid? Cause like I can complain about anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So we want to see, we want to see the complaints. They wouldn't give them to us, but when we sent a lawyer down there, she got them, which <laughs> is like, Jesus Christ, I gotta pay, I gotta pay $250 an hour just to get like three goddamn. Dude, really? That's all it was. Three written complaints. Wow. That's f-ing stupid. These whiny little... I don't want to make things worse for you, so I'm going to shut up right there. I don't think anybody in my town listens to this show. Mm, I know there's several people in your town that listen to this show. Uh, they are not in my town. Oh, okay. Your mom doesn't live in town? Uh, my mom doesn't listen to this show. Mm, are you sure? Because she's always texting me stuff that I say and tell me how cute it is. <laughs> she she usually just tells me in person. Oh, is some, is some people's going to die? <laughs> I think so. I think so. So, Jeremy, uh, running your own range for as you have for a while now, you've seen things grow a bit. Uh, clearly, seeing more traffic and things like that. But what's uh, what are some of the guns that you've been seeing a lot of lately? A lot of yeah, like when people come in, like what do you see a ton of? Um. I don't really ask to see people's guns. I mean, if they want to talk about them, they talk about them. Sometimes some really cool ones come in. Uh, yeah, some had a uh, CZ38 in the other day. Nice. Have you ever seen one of them? I have not. So they're really interesting. There's a button on the side that – so it's really weird. So the barrel and the – the, the it, I don't know how to explain this. The barrel isn't part of the – the barrel's like affixed to the top of the gun but not the frame, and it's held in by a bushing on the front that's actually on a hinge. A bushing on the front. Oh, yeah, I see that actually. Okay, I'm yeah. looking at it. So they, they like, it like hinges up and comes off. Oh, so if you've never seen one, they're really cool. I suggest you go look at one. They're pr- they're pretty uh, they're pretty they're pretty interesting guns. So, um, so I get to see cool stuff like that a lot. Every now and again, somebody brings in somebody something really cool. Um, I always gotta ruin people's dreams when they bring in a gun and they think it's worth like thousands of dollars. Or I feel like Antiques Roadshow. Uh, pretty much most of the time, when I'm like, yeah, this is worth like fifty bucks. Or the other time I'm like, you realize this is like a $10,000 gun, right? And they're like, what? <laughs> this is just like my grandpa. This is like grandpa's old hunting rifle. I'm like, yeah, they made 50 of these like ever. <laughs> and the guy's like, holy <laughs> like it's just been sitting in the closet for 50 years. Like, yeah. Kind of like you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and uh, yeah, your wife's closet. Oh, oh, creepy. There, we, there we go. <laughs> That's so creepy. And. What? uh, (laughs) I laugh because I'm scared. The the weird thing would be is if Aaron was in that place, he'd be like, "Yeah, it's worth nothing." You know what? Uh, You're a friend. I'll give you I'll give you 200 bucks for it. Um, But literally, you might as well just like throw it in the trash on the way out. That's yeah. So it's it's uh so so I get to see cool stuff like that. I mean, it's the mainstays. It's the ones that you think they are. 
most of the guns that come through are some AR or, you know, or uh, a Glock or a Springfield or a Smith or a Shield or, a, you know, whatever. It, it, it's the main ones that you think of most of the time. Every now and again, somebody brings something in that's, like, really cool, and I get to play with it. Nice. Like the CZ-38. Oh. But then they mm-hmm. get creeped out and they leave the shop because you're playing with it? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're one of few ranges that actually allow machine guns. In fact, you rent them. In fact, we rent them. But we actually allow people to bring their own machine guns in. Yeah, that that's pretty f- cool. So do you have a lot of those actually coming in? So we have, So now that people know we allow it, a lot of them come in. Nice. Um, so, uh, and, and the rule is you can shoot a machine gun there, but I get to play with it. <laughs> that, that's a pretty good rule. Uh, and most people, and most people with machine guns are pretty happy to share them. Yeah. Um, generally. Cause they're lonely cause yeah. they're old and rich. Yeah. Um, so we got a, a bunch of guys, uh, uh, that, that actually own another shop, but they don't have a range and they were working on a couple MG 42s. Yeah. So they needed to test fire them. So they brought them in to test fire them and to make sure they were cycling properly. So I got to shoot M- MG42s, uh, I mean, Uzis, Thompsons, uh, uh, Stens. Uh, d- 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 I mean, a lot of a BAR. One guy had a BAR. That's that was cool. kind of fun. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but yeah, so it's been, that's, that's kind of cool that, I mean, it's not every day, but it's, it's often enough. It's, it's, once once every other week or so, somebody comes in with something pretty cool. That's very cool. Uh, all right. And then uh, last but not least, I, I did want to real quick. I, I did take the, the second part of my Blade Tactics <laughs> seminar from Ronin Tactics. Uh, really, when I was looking for like some knife classes, I was like, yeah, you know, when, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So if all you have is a gun and that's the only skill you possess, then that seems to be the the, the finisher of most problems for you. So I, I did want to take some knife classes, uh, and no offense to our ninja brethren, but I wanted to, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time like doing philosophy and forms and kata and all kinds of shit like that. I just wanted to learn, like if someone tries to f- me up with a knife, how do I f- them up first with a knife? And the, this blade tactic seminar, I did two of them, four hours each, uh, t- uh, on two Saturdays, uh, two weeks apart from each other. Illuminati confirmed the, uh, it was exactly that, man. It was like, it, it was like maybe an hour and 20 minutes of lecture out of four hours. And then the rest of that time was all just sparring. And, um, we did some flow drills, which I really, at, at the, at the beginning, I was like, this is exactly what I didn't want to do. But then the, the more we did them. And then when he showed us immediately how those transitioned into like real fighting, uh, I was like, okay, this is, this is really cool. So it was really valuable. I thought it was fantastic and it was exactly what I was looking for. So I highly recommend Ronin, Ronin Tactics and Two Lamb. Uh, Nick, you said you wanted to take it the next time it comes. Yeah, definitely. He also teaches a class called Street Fighter that I want to take the next time it comes here. And it's more of that stuff, just like hand to hand stuff, but really none of the fluff, all the all the does physicality. He, does he teach you the uh what is Broken. it? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so, but that would be Hoboken, cool. New Jersey. Whoa. whoa. <laughs> Um, so I definitely highly recommend that if you have a chance to train with, with two and, uh, that'll do it for gear chat. Now it's time for, you know, what time. Aaron, how you doing? I'm um, okay. <laughs> Are you uncomfortable? Uh, uh, thanks, thanks to DDP for that. I love it so much. Um, double, double. D- DDP. That's and, that's the dude that made our the, the made it for us, and also double, the Mar- Uh I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But Brownells brings us to us. I've been spending a lot of time on Brownells looking for a fucking spotting scope. Have you, uh, Nick and I have been talking back and forth a bit because I'm trying to find the one that's like budget because, A, we're not going to be shooting, you know, a mile with it or anything like that. But also just because like people are on budgets. And I'm like, yeah, we 
Can we have a $2,000, $3,000 spotting scope sent to us? Yes. Does our audience care that much about a $2,000, $3,000 spotting scope? Maybe, but maybe with, a couple of them. Yeah, maybe a couple of them, but the the majority of them care about one that's like you know regular guy prices, and I think that's kind of the one that that I'm most interested in. So, mm. I've been Have looking. You binoculars. Uh, I've got binoculars. We we use them when we were shooting out to 400, and they were reasonably okay, but less than ideal. Yeah, less than ideal. But we need a spotting scope, man. We've uh, we we had talked about it, and we we really need one. I've narrowed it down to an Athlon for about two hundred bucks, or a Vortex Diamondback for about five hundred bucks. Um, clearly, I know the Diamondback is going to be the best, but the value of the other one, ugh, same magnification, same objective lens, uh, millimeters measurement, and it's tough. So I've been looking for a lot of reviews. I haven't made a decision yet. Jeremy, do you have any advice on spotting scope? Reasonable, reasonably priced spotting scope. Uh, I mean, you said two that I was thinking of, so no, there's nothing to add. Okay, cool. So anyway, I was looking on Brownells. They have a lot of different options, and I've been kind of soliciting opinions from a bunch of different people. And we'll, we'll make a decision soon, but the cool thing is Brownells, you know, gunsmithing stuff, guns, also tons and tons of glass, whether it's binoculars, whether it's spotting scopes, whether it's optics or anything else. And you can find it all brownells.com. Great sales every single day. And the Edge program, which is Amazon Prime. For your gun parts, 48 hour, uh, what is it? Two day free shipping, yeah, two day. Um, upgrade or a uh, lower price next day, just like Amazon Prime. So you can get the stuff you need. Aaron, I mean, I mean, two like TWO day, not two day. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, what, what did you want to talk about? Uh, grips, grips. I want to talk about grips. Like, see this grip right here? Yeah, A2. Right. Now, when I shoot my AR, I hold it like this. Uh huh. But I was watching a video with you and Nick, and you guys were holding it like this with your thumb on the opposing side of where it's normally located. Yeah. Now, Nick provided a video uh, by Ryan Kleckner stating that, you know, gripping, the, gripping a gun while shooting precision with a pistol grip can be detrimental to your shooting ability or your, your, your shot placement. And, and I thought that was really interesting. And Nick, why is that? And, and let me, let's see if we can phrase this. So if you pick up a water bottle, you've got your thumb on one side of the bottle and the rest of your fingers on the other side of the bottle. And if you put that into an AR grip with that thumb on that other side, and then you put pressure on it in, in any direction, you can basically do what, Nick? Uh, I mean, you can, you can pull a shot that way. Um, the, the idea being that your thumb, just like, the rest of your fingers basically can move a little sympathetically uh, with your other fingers. So even if you try really hard uh, not to move your thumb when you pull that index finger, it can be very easy to pull that thumb in, uh, which can affect the way that the gun uh, moves as you fire. And typically what you don't really want to have a whole lot uh, more contact than is absolutely necessary with the gun when you're shooting long range stuff. So obviously this isn't going to be something that like a three gunner would use while they are uh, moving and shooting or something. You know, this is uh, your shooting from a, a bench rest or prone position or whatever. And you are on bags or a bipod or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so yeah, the idea is that you've got your, uh, three fingers on the grip, pulling the gun back into your shoulder. Um, your thumb is over on you, the strong side of the firearm, um, not pushing on the gun. Yeah. Thumbs and fingers are all on the same side. Right. And, uh, and then of course your trigger finger is doing what your trigger finger does. Yeah. And, and it really does get you to grip the gun less because it's usually supported in other ways. Now, if I mean, you're standing or something else, then it's, you, you don't do that. You don't move and shoot with your thumb on the wrong side of the, the grip or anything like that. But when you're trying to keep human contact with the firearm to the very absolute minimum, that, that helps do that. And that's why we do it. I, th I don't know where I learned that, but uh, I know Kleckner does it. I know pretty much everyone I know that shoots long range does it. Have you ever seen that, Jeremy? And your thoughts on it? What's that? Thumb. <laughs> Not not wrapping your thumb around the pistol grip yeah, on no, an AR yeah. or on a bolt gun. I, 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 I've seen lots of people do that. I mean, it's you do you boo boo. boo if you can do it effectively either way, 
do do what works for you. Yeah. Now, does it actually affect me? I don't know. I'm not shooting at distances that it probably does. Uh, but for longer range, yeah, I can imagine that. So I get in the habit because it, it does make sense. <laughs> Anything else, Aaron? Well, it's like I tried to – okay. No, go ahead. So I was trying to explain to some lady um, about how her shooting a pistol on a pistol grip, how your grip can affect your shot, right? Yeah. And this is the only time I really use a laser on a gun is to show my, all right, here, I'm holding the gun. Now all I'm going to do is tighten my three fingers on the grip, right? Yep. Tighten here and you can watch a laser dip, dip low left or go left or in that general area where most beginning pistol shooters, right? Yep. And I said, okay, hold your hand. Just make a V with your hand and open your fingers up. And she goes, okay. And I said, no, okay, now. And I held the slide and I put the 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 the, the V of her hand up on the on the beaver tail. And I just grabbed the slide and slid it back in her hand. But the slide cycled, obviously, and it didn't. It just her hand stopped it. And then I let the slide come back forward. And then I did it again. I did it again. And I did it again. I'm like. What I'm like, are you white knuckling this thing? She's like, well, I don't want to drop it. I'm like, but that's not the way the force is going. The only thing your finger is doing on the front of the grip is keeping when the slide comes forward from like coming out. You don't have to like white knuckle the thing. We're not, you know, all the force is going into your hand. You don't even need to have your hands closed to stop that and to try to get it through her head. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, taking that pressure off that you don't need that could cause movement on longer range shots. Pretty much it. All right, Aaron, you got anything else there? Uh, no. Are you going to start, are you going to start shooting like that now? I'm going to give it a shot. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to, I'm going to try it out and see how it feels. Um, you know, it's different manual of arms. So definitely something you're, I'm going to have to work into. Um, but I'm, Really would like to uh, improve any any aspect I can I can improve. I'm going to try it. Yeah, same. How about becoming a better person? <laughs> okay, well now you're just being ridiculous. I mean, or, that's something no, 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 we no, should all work on. Person. A good person. Well, that's like once again, dude. that's something yeah. we should all work on. Wow, Un- unattainable goals, Jeremy. <laughs> Come on now. That's just that's that's terrible. All right. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I feel like we all have better chances of going to the moon than we do being better people yeah but you know who is a better person uh, i'm a good people it's because he's not here it's savage, it's savage. One and yeah. it's not that he's a good person because he's not here it's just that everything's better because he's not here yeah. from sea to shining sea america gets its news from one source who gets his source from Aaron and sources Sean. It's time for Going Ballistic with Sam Aaron and Sean. Lamar. Brought to you by Facts and Firearms. <laughs> F- savage. I hope he listens to this and I hope he knows that I hate him. I hope he knows, <laughs> I hope he knows that you want to have intercourse with him. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, again? Because you just said F- savage. Yeah. Which leads me to believe that you are wishing that you could do so. No. You know what you stopped saying, Sean, was you're f- me. I never said that. You did. No, I, I say that would be very painful if you me. I, I would never you. You're my favorite. You're, you're joking me. I've never literally said that at all. No, you have. Mm. Yeah, you've said you're me. I mean, I've probably said it in my life. Because that joke has been made a lot. Yeah. No, First off, hurt facts and firearms. Me. What about the FX-19 pistols, the Patriot and the Hellfire that they've I mean, created? Those are, those are basically the best thing ever. Yeah, they're coming out soon. Yeah. They're cool what about uh, the 450 Bushmaster barrel, bolt carrier group, gas block, muzzle device? Nick, what about the 458 SOCOM mm-hmm. barrel and gas block and bolt carrier group and muzzle device? Also the best things ever. What about the pencil barrels with the really small muzzle brake that you can put a gas block over? Uh, 14.5 man. inches pinned and welded. Those are those are really neat. Those are probably one of the best things ever. What about the carbon fiber handguards and the lightweight uh, AR-15? Okay, now the carbon fiber handguards, because they're carbon fiber and they're super sexy, those are legitimately the best things ever. Yes. All those other things are like tied for second place, but the carbon fiber handguards, we should bring that first gun. place. We should bring that gun to the range tomorrow. Yeah. Wait, there's one of those here. I have a fax on lightweight. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm looking at the screen, and it actually looks like... um. Need help? Chat with us. Right, right above my head here. What? Uh-huh. It might be on yours because depending on where you get placed in the in the queue in the bottom. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Oh yeah, I see it right there. Yeah. What about it? Should I? No. Remember? Remember, remember <laughs> that time I did anymore. it to Gunbroker or whatever? <laughs> this is. It was man, and they like they, like just cut you off. They like disappeared. Backsandfirearms dot com coupon code is WLS ten. Let's get into the news, Aaron. Don't forget that we summarize, provide our opinion. Go to the cast. Shall I begin? Yeah, you do it, buddy. The bump stock ban, which we've heard many different conflicting reports saying that it's it's there's an injunction that it starts tomorrow. We got the skinny. Sean did some research, and what'd you find, Sean? Well. So we took uh, my bump stocks to the range last week because we were going to blow them up with Tannerite because, you know, might as well f***ing enjoy it when we have to get rid of my property. Uh, but I had messaged Adam Kraut in the morning and I was like, dude, should I just blow these things up or should I wait? And he's all, I don't know. Just wait till the 11th hour is what I would do. So I did. And right now, literally the 11th hour uh, tomorrow morning or actually in uh, it's 927 here. So two and a half hours. Uh, bump stocks become illegal in the United States, and they've either have to be uh, turned over or destroyed by that time. So, uh, f- you, I'm on the Eastern Seaboard. It's 30 minutes. All right, so 30 minutes, uh, and it probably is Eastern time because you know Washington um, D.C. Uh, we're we're going off Hawaii time. Okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. So basically, uh, millions of people who own bump stocks would be federal felons tomorrow. <laughs> Well, uh, the Firearms Policy Foundation, who has uh, hired Josh Prince and Adam Kraut and the Prince Law Firm to take care of this and file these these things, uh, we we got an update today. There there was lots of frantic work going on uh, to kind of figure out what what's going on. Um, a stay, which is basically a way to put the the brakes on the rule going into effect, ha- has been granted. In the specific lawsuit that FPF and Adam Kraut and Josh Prince have actually done. But the problem is, is that then they were like, okay, but what does that mean? Does that mean just the people in this lawsuit, which is just a few people? Or does that mean everybody that owns a bump stock? And uh, a decision came back today that it's the people named in the lawsuit and bona fide members of the organization that has filed the lawsuit being the firearms policy foundation. So what does that mean? That means that members of this firearms policy foundation that put forth this lawsuit are affected by the stay. So how do you become a member? Join FPF.org. I posted on our Facebook page today. By the time the show is published, it's going to be uh, too late, but I mean, maybe you could join tomorrow. I don't know how that really affects it. But it's it's the word join. FP, it's not just don't you're not stating a fact of join. No, it's, it's actually part of the web address is join. Join FPF dot org. And if you are a member, a bona fide member, which you can become for one dollar right now, join FPF dot org. Uh, by doing so, you are a bona fide member. And that stay has been granted. That relief has been granted to the named individuals in the in the or, uh, the lawsuit, I guess, whatever it is the injunction request, whatever it happens to be, and bona fide members. So I, I'm 99% sure that I, I'm a member of Firearms Policy Coalition, uh, but just to be sure, I, I signed up again today and donated more money uh, to make sure that I was a member uh, today. So my bump stocks tomorrow are not illegal. They are they are affected by this uh, stay. And, you know, we'll find out more going forward, but at least tomorrow I'm not a felon. Don't wait till it's too late. You can be a felon anytime you want. Well, what now? I, I, I don't know, man. I just – I feel like I was late on the last – don't wait till it's too late, so I had to <laughs> yeah. throw it out there. Nick, what do you think? I, I think this whole thing is – Yeah, me too. Yeah. So f***ing dumb. But All of it. On the one hand, we don't get to blow stuff up. On the other hand, I'm glad I don't have to blow them up. Me. Yeah. Me. I mean, it just sucks that you're being – that people are being denied uh, due process. They're being denied uh, – you know, value for their products that they purchased. I mean, it just seems like that, that, that that's unconstitutional. Yeah. Yeah. It's dumb. So Aaron, you, you know, we've got guns, they're protected. It's an individual, right? We found that in the Supreme court. Um, but what about bullets? What about yeah, bullets, cartridges? Bullets? I don't know if they're, uh, if they're covered under the, uh, under the uh, Second Amendment, because they're not the firearms. It's what you know you put in the firearms. And there's actually a national bullet control bill that was put out uh, by the Democrats. They have uh, like 56 co-sponsors, and the idea is basically modeled off of California's idea, where uh, you go in, 
you go to purchase your ammo, you pay your fee, you pay a, a fee to have a background check done, and if you pass the background check, you can have the ammo, yeah. which is complete. It's so ridiculous because Nix is already overloaded. Uh, you know, like on is the weekends. that a fat joke? Oh, <laughs> actually, yeah, Nick is overloaded <laughs> with sausage. Um, but yeah, like Nix is already swamped. My own sausage. You would have to literally go fill out a forty four seventy three, do a background a Nick's background check. Um, they do have caveats in there for people with valid state issued firearms permits to be uh, that were issued within the last five years would not have to submit a check before they could buy ammo. Exceptions made for police and military as well as those sharing ammunition between immediate family members. This is like absolutely and completely and utterly ridiculous. It's put forward by Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And I, this is, this is the kind of thing that goes to the Supreme court if it passes. Um, and, and if it passes, so if it passes, it goes to the Supreme court. I mean, just think about it. If, if the Supreme court comes back and says, look, you know, you can't do that because stuff that you, stuff that firearms use can't be, uh, can't be infringed upon just like a firearm. You know, that might even mean that like suppressors are no longer allowed to be infringed upon with tax stamps and background checks and things like that. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting, but God, they're just coming after it hard. They're coming after everything hard. They hate our freedom guys. They hate our freedom and they hate us because we enjoy the freedom of the second amendment. And I don't like them very much either. Yeah. No, Nick, what do you think? I I think it's me too, man. Hey guys, you know, it's not what, uh, New York stunning. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> this is a stunning story. Uh, both Illinois and New York had banned stun guns and tasers, saying that they were, uh, they, they're, not, they're not weapons. They're just uh, tools that can be used by rapists and murderers. Um, I don't know what their exact definition of why they couldn't be used. But now the court says they can. They're bearable firearms, guys. So you can carry those in New York and Illinois and not get in trouble. And you know who we have to thank for this? We have, we have two lawyers' names that we say on here all the time. Adam Kraut and? Ryan Kleckner. All right, we have three lawyers' names that we say on here all the time. Sean Adam, Maloney. Thank you. Uh, how about Stephen Stambolia? Yeah, uh, he was yeah. in the New York case. Yeah, he he uh, helped fight for the right for people to have stun guns because it was a, it was considered a uh, misdemeanor over there. Uh, you could get uh, you can get Mister Meaner, <laughs> Mister Meaner. <laughs> so 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 Mister, you're meaner. No, it, but they said it was unconstitutional. You know what really it falls on is, is Heller. It, it, it always it seems like all the gun laws just fall back on Heller. Well, the Illinois case was Satano, 2016 ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court that found stun guns to be bearable weapons under the Constitution, and also the Heller ruling that that said that the right to bear arms is an individual right. So kind of both of those, Satano and Heller, uh, in both of these cases, big deals. Nick, what do you think? Not the opposite of Very nice. Jeremy? Uh, do you every time I hear the word Saitano, all I think is South Park singing Brian Boitano. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what would Brian Boitano do? <laughs> <laughs> every time you say that, I'm like, it pops in my head. I'm like, God, <laughs> <laughs> what would Chris Saitano do? I love it. Uh, speaking of Illinois, Aaron. Yeah, check this out. See, Illinois has been a is not always a gun friendly location. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Such as the uh, village of Deerfield, which uh, banned assault rifles or any gun that's capable of holding more than 10 rounds of ammunition. And if you got caught with it and you didn't get rid of it, $1,000 a day fine. So uh, I went to court and the court said, look, man, uh, Illinois has a preemption. You can't make a law that, that overstates the state law. So they had to throw it off the books in Deerfield. You residents there, you guys can have your assault weapons back. Well, and Deerfield knew this. They knew preemption existed. They knew that they weren't allowed, cities and counties and all that stuff weren't allowed to enact such a ban. Uh, but they did it because they, they put it, they made it a, an amendment to their existing laws. And the judge was actually pretty pissed off about it and threw it out. And Deerfield, now they are saying that they're closely reviewing the ruling and are keeping all options available, including the right to appeal uh, the decision of the Illinois Appellate Court. So this is really good news. Uh, especially for people who live in Deerfield, I guess. But uh, Nick, what do you think? I think it's. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Satano. You know what else? Is what? Massachusetts gun laws. Uh, they're so they are kind of dumb. So you know what? Uh, great company, Smith and Wesson, are like this. We're out of here. They gave them the big finger, and they are moving. 
Yeah, they're, so they've got a big Ma- Massachusetts warehouse. They're going to move it to Missouri, uh, hire about 150 extra people. The people who live in Massachusetts, I guess, are either moving with them or, or, or leaving the company. And, you know, it, it's this is happening a lot more, a lot more often. Companies are leaving the places where they've been for a very long time for places with better gun laws. And they're taking their money, their employment, uh, their tax contributions and everything with them. And Massachusetts doesn't care. But good for Smith & Wesson. They, they've had good sales numbers, uh, driven really on the back of the, the 380 Easy. I'm sorry, the Smith & Wesson Shield 380 Easy M2.0. I mean, have they really sold that many of those? Or do you, think it's, do you think it's the uh, I sell a ton of those M&P? No, man. I, I've actually seen the reports that uh, a lot of Smith & Wesson's success in the last 18 months has been riding on the success of the 380 Easy. That's actually surprising to me. I mean, I, I like the gun, but not what I would expect. We just did our first review of the 380 Easy, mm-hmm. um, and we did it, it in a new segment called Storytime with WLS. That that video will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Super excited! Super excited! Yeah. You know what I'm not excited about? What? The over New Jersey. God, their stupid attorney general, such a f-ing idiot. Oh, he is. Um, he was like, hey, California, you can't sell guns in New Jersey. You can't send them over here. I'm going to sue the company that makes gun parts because, you know what, we don't like your ideas. Well, no, they've, they've sent out these letters all over the country. They've, they've said that they are going to come after Incor, any company who sends a product that is legal in their jurisdiction but illegal in New Jersey. So if you order, what is what was it, an 80 percent receiver? It was. Yeah, so if you order an 80% receiver and you reside in New Jersey and a California company fulfills that, New Jersey thinks that somehow they have jurisdiction over everything and everybody and that they're going to take that California company to court. What was the name of that California company? U.S. Patriot something? Yeah, U.S. Patriot Armory. And, uh, you know, a dude ordered it. They sent it. It was a sting. They, they, they sent U.S. Patriot Armory a letter saying that they were going to prosecute anyone that sent 80% receivers to New Jersey. And then they had an undercover officer order an 80% receiver to New Jersey, and now they have filed lawsuit against this gun reseller, uh, retailer. Such What do you think about that, Jeremy? Um, I think this man should be strung up in the streets and hung for breaking his oath to the Constitution of the United States, much like most people that push an anti-gun agenda. Metaphorically, cl- clearly. No, no. literally. Well, I heard he was hung. No, he's Sikh. <laughs> Nick, what do you think? Uh, so, so what they're going after him for is not manufacturing this stuff. It's it's sending it to a state where it is illegal to possess. Correct? Yeah. Uh, which I again, it they should. I mean, they can prosecute their citizen, but they have mm-hmm. no jurisdiction in another state. I I I don't know. Um, I mean, if I. Say, uh, if, not federally speaking, but say I go to one of the dispensaries here where I can legally, according to state law, buy marijuana, and then I send it to a friend in Mississippi where it's illegal. I was gonna say, I was gonna say yeah, but, that, but it's illegal federally. Well, no, well, federal federal law aside, could could the law enforcement in Mississippi? Uh, potentially come after me? So that's a really bad example because of the nature of the thing. But okay. In California, no, not- is it is it legal for a company to manufacture eighty percent receivers? Sure. Yes. Is it illegal in the United States to ship an eighty percent receiver to someone who orders one? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the Heller decision, Justice Scalia mentioned it might be constitutional to regulate commercial sale of guns, but implied is that it would not be constitutional to regulate private sales of the manufacture of guns by individuals for their own use. So they're not sending a gun; they're mm-hmm. sending something that is not a gun. They're sending a, a hunk of metal. It's legal for them to sell it. It's legal for them to make it. And they just sent it to the person who ordered it. So I, I truly don't understand how New Jersey. So New Jersey does have an anti-ghost gun law? Yeah, but it, who cares? Right. Like, I don't see how okay. that affects so, California. So weed is a bad example. So let's say a switchblade. Okay. Uh, same situation, but with a, a switchblade or any other item that's I – mean, I, I don't know. I mean – Technically speaking, if if uh, I am an FFL and I ship someone a gun to New Jersey that is illegal to uh, possess in New Jersey, or I or I sell a resident from New Jersey uh, that gun, um, I I can get in trouble for that. 
Would you say that a corporation is responsible for knowing and understanding every intricacy of every single law in every single jurisdiction across the United States? Um, I mean, no. However, uh, ignorance of the law is not necessarily a defense. So I, I'm certainly not justifying this. No, I, I understand. I'm just, I'm just interested to see if this is something that could potentially end up being legitimate. I, I am too. I, I can't see any way. I'm like, first off, listen, the federal government, they can come after you for whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you... Here's a perfect example. Okay. I think I, I okay. figured it out. Sean, you're driving in Michigan. Okay. You get a speeding ticket in Michigan. Okay. You return to Colorado. Yes. Can Michigan prosecute you while you're in Colorado for that Michigan speeding ticket? No, I don't can't. think so. They could, they could, they could, they could I mean, if I come back to Michigan and I'm in, yes. in their sovereign territory. Yes. Exactly. In Michigan, you could be, uh, you know, get a bench warrant against you, right. but they can't do anything to you while you're in Colorado. I mean, I mean, these, the, the guys from New Jersey aren't going to go to California and kick these doors down and, you know, drag these people out, but there might be a court date. And if the people from California miss that court date, there might be a warrant put out for them. And if they come to New Jersey, you know, um, they might get picked up. Okay. That, that would make sense. It all, it would also be stupid as hell because, yeah. huh? All right. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, you can just send your lawyers too. You don't even have to show up. Yeah. True. True. Just hire lawyers in New Jersey. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to tie this up in court forever because the first thing they're going to do is want to change a venue because they operated under their local laws. So they're going to say you can't sue us in a place that that you know doesn't has no jurisdiction over the laws. That so I I, I feel like that would be the big issue here, right? Is where did the sale take place? Because one of the parties was in uh, Jersey, in Jersey, and one of one of the parties was in California. Correct. And it was an online purchase Mm -hmm. so you you would have to argue about where the purchase actually took place and i'm sure there's precedent for that but i mean the point of purchase would be new jersey but the point of sale would be california right so 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 where did the transaction occur right well if the money if the money was pulled from california then the transaction took place in california if they're using a, a, a company in New Jersey to, to uh, charge the person, then it took place in New Jersey. But I'm pretty sure that someone in California is not going to be using a money transfer system out of New Jersey. Hmm. Interesting. I, I don't even ship guns to California. Right. Like, I turn money down. when yeah. I have, It is such – like, there's extra paperwork that I have to go, like, find on a website for California to ship a gun to an FFL in California – and the guy, like, I didn't do it the first time. I didn't know. I shipped a couple of guns to California. And then the FFL called me and he's like, well, I can't do anything with these till you fill all these forms out. And I'm like, what the f*** are you talking about? Like, f*** you. Like, I don't <laughs> right. give a I did, I did what I was supposed to. Like, I won't ship them because I know I'll just that FFL that I send the guns to because I'm not doing it anymore. No, I totally understand that. Stupid. We'll we'll follow this case closely and see where it comes to. And guys, that'll do it for the best episode, the best segment of Going Ballistic that has ever occurred. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, fantastic job, Aaron. Good job. Uh, and oh guys, no, I was just responding to the crowd. Actually, yeah, I know, I know. You were you were doing the. Are you not entertained? <laughs> uh, I do this brings us to our favorite part of the show. It's positively posturing, positively posturing. And this is where Jeremy reads the reviews and the recommendations on Facebook. So if you have iTunes, leave us a review there. If you have it on Facebook, we would really appreciate it if you leave us one there. And uh, that brings us to the reviews. Jeremy, take it away, buddy. Fight Club by Tyler D. Five stars. Unlike the Fight Club I belong to, the first rule of WLS Club is to talk about WLS Club. The second rule of WLS Club is don't get drunk around Jeremy. Mm. I mean, I think I'm pretty fun. Yeah, I, th- I think yeah. you're pretty fun too, actually. Yeah, a whole as a whole. In fact, one of the best things about Jeremy drinking and us drinking around Jeremy is that we lose all fear of Jeremy, and then Jeremy reminds us why we had the fear in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, where were we, Georgia, when he punched me in the stomach and it gave me a bruise for like six Dude, months? <laughs> that bruise was huge. Dude, it, was, <laughs> it was the size of a personal watermelon. Right, and you didn't even like realize you had a bruise until the next day, which was even the more funny. And I think you guys just like heard me scream from the bathroom. <laughs> 
That bruise was amazing. I assumed that your kidney was like it just exploded in there. I know. <laughs> it's the only thing that would be clear. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Tyler D. Uh, Jeremy, I, I think you're pretty fun to hang out with too. Uh, next review. This show by Ronan Son, five stars. Can Jeremy see in color because everything is so black and white to him? I love the show. My favorite is Aaron, not because he brings the most to the table, because he doesn't, but because he is a wild card and you never know what to expect. It is like he has a rare form of Tourette's syndrome. <laughs> Tourette's, not Tourette's. Tourette's. Oh, Tourette's. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, because my guns are going everywhere. Uh... <laughs> you know what? Most of the world is black and white, and people complicate it. See where, I, and the, that's the funny thing is, I think that everything is gray. I don't think there's any right answers. There are a lot of right answers, like don't <laughs> kids. That's that that's that's a black and white kind of thing. I, what if you're a kid? Huh? What if you're a, what if you are also a kid? You shouldn't be. <laughs> what if you're a priest? <laughs> Like okay. you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was a kid. I was 14 when I lost my virginity. I, I mean, you know what I mean. Also, when I gave up my Catholic roots. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, I know. Oh, father. I know exactly what you mean, but I'm like gray area, right? So, 14- no, it's not a gray area because sexual, when you reach sexual maturity as a human being, we should be adults by then. Okay. But the I- problem is. The way our society is set up, we infantilize sh- adults and still treat them like children to the point where adolescence is now late 20s. A 14-year-old has sex with a 14-year-old and tells an adult. That adult tells somebody else, and eventually the other 14-year-old's parents find out. And then they call the police because they can't imagine that their perfect little angel would ever have sex with a dirty little piece of sh- named Jeremy P. Um, that 14-year-old should be and married with a job. Okay. He's fully capable of that. Well, instead, that 14 year old gets prosecuted for uh, having sex with a minor, even though they're also a minor. That wouldn't happen in. That has happened. My, it has my, happened. My, well, it, has, it wouldn't happen in my state because there's laws that say it's okay. <laughs> uh, and it also applies and also to cousins. But there's, you, a, there's, a, there's a closeness of age law here. So I get it. But I'm saying it's a gray area because not everything can be black and white because you put it into that perspective and you're like, that makes no f-ing sense. A 14 year old and a 14 year old, even though they're stupid, uh, that, that is not child molestation. That is not sexual assault against a minor. That is nothing. Therefore, that is a gray area and that is clearly not black and white. And there are always situations that That's I think. Clear- black and white it's either right or it's wrong you have to look at the situation but it's either right or wrong it's not wrong what about a 16 year old and a 21 i didn't say it was wrong i said it's either right or wrong but you have to look at the situation saying well hmm hum hmm no make a decision about your god life or about something well and and i totally agree with that but when we talk about black and white and we talk about putting laws into place those laws affect everybody even if there is a gray area my feelings on Laws. Yeah, and I'm 100 percent with you on that. Okay, what, so. what, what about a 44 year old and a 16 year old? In in a moral sense or in a legal sense? Legal. Aaron's like, in I'm just sense. wondering if I have a chance. What state? Uh, let's type because Ohio, Michigan. Because, <laughs> because no in the state of Ohio, the, the age of consent is 16. So it, that, in, that's, yeah, same in Michigan as long, well. Well, here, here it is in Michigan, as long as with parent consent. No, that has nothing. That, that has no bearing. Well, here in Michigan, and that's how it's set up. Like a sixteen-year-old can be with anyone they want as long as their parents are okay with it. What the actual? That's that's what parent? No, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's crazy. Okay, next review. All right. This is America by Billy Wayne Rudick. 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 I don't know how you say that. Five stars. Only a man who loves his country as much as Savage One R would be prepared to help would be prepared to break the law and work with America's enemies to help it. <laughs> Only a man who truly loves his wife would pay off a prostitute's silence so as to avoid hurting her feelings. This is why I love the show, because Savage is the only true American who happens to be a commie. I don't understand that at all. What? I think I think he's trying to make a joke here. What joke? Uh, yeah. He is comparing Savage's love for communism um, to Trump, even though he loves America, to a man paying off a prostitute to not tell his wife 
uh, that he had sex with her. Okay, break the law and work with America's enemies to help it. Okay, so is he talking about Rus- Russian collusion, which doesn't f-ing exist? I, I think he's saying that Savage has collusion. Savage is a Russian. Well, and, and okay, all right. And then a man who truly loves his wife would pay off a prostitute silence so as to avoid hurting her feelings. That also. So relates. maybe he slept with a prostitute or a stripper no. named Stormy Daniels. I don't. I don't. I don't think, think Savage could. I, sleep. I think you guys are looking way too far into this. I don't think it's about Trump. I think both even of these though, r- relate to Trump. And even Savages, though you want them to be. And Savage hates Trump, and that's why. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I mean, confused. that I could see. Yeah. What else can you see? That I could see a guy make, comparing Savage to Trump just to piss Savage off. <laughs> what they do both you th- have the same hair. What do you think, Aaron? Are we reading too I, much into it? or? Yeah, I, th- I think it's just satire at this point. I don't f***ing get it, man. Well, I, all right, let's let's break it down. Uh, hey, Sav- Billy, Billy Wayne Ruddick, uh, explain your joke. Yeah, that's a good – Billy Wayne Ruddick, contact us. Maybe leave another review next week. Let us know what the hell's up. <laughs> all right, that makes sense. And don't forget to check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. That's sdi.edu. Uh, they sponsor – the review segment. And guys, it's time to wrap this shit up. There's a place you can go. It's L O V E W L S. Love W L S dot com. There's four things you can do there. Aaron, tell me one of them. You're muted. I, I, I muted just as so yeah, I can talk. You took a deep breath off of mute <laughs> and then it <laughs> muted the actual stuff. That's funny because uh, when I edit all the videos, I, I know when you're about to talk because you're like, <laughs> the mics yeah. are right by your face. So I go, I'm like, okay, right now. Okay, so anyhow, one of the things you could do at, at uh, that website is become a roof topper, earn rewards, get cool stuff, and all you got to do is post a link to the show. So true. Nick, what's another thing you can do there? Uh, you can provide water for puppies, or you can buy sweet merchandise. That's so true. Just like that We Like Shooting hoodie mm-hmm. that Nick's wearing, the We Like Shooting monogram hoodie that Murdered Out that Aaron is wearing, mm-hmm. uh, the WLS uh, trucker cap, cap that I'm wearing, the WLS t-shirt that i'm wearing all of it man it's all there jeremy oh, thanks jeremy for representing jeremy what's another thing you can do with that love WLS? i don't know i don't pay attention to this what if uh what about being a patreon okay cool do that give us money all right i got cool. I got, I got a baby to feed <laughs> what about uh money please what about our advertisers and links to their websites and all their coupon codes can you do that there Pro- probably since you said it okay yeah you can love wls.com that's <laughs> Whichever one of that gets me paid for this, <laughs> shit, that's the one you should do. I got, I got, I got mouths to feed now. Then do all of them, all of and them. And I don't got hair and money. <laughs> do it for Jeremy's children. Uh, also, guys, we've got the shootout challenge going. That's we like shooting dot com slash shootout. We've got the, our patches and everything. We like shooting dot com slash store. But you can find it at lovewls dot com as well. We got videos coming out every single day on our YouTube channel. That's youtube dot com slash we like shooting. Our live shows are on our YouTube channel, WLSlive.com, and that'll just about do it. We always tell you to join a gun-related advocacy group, and in fact, if you don't join the Firearms Policy Foundation on the 25th of March, then tomorrow, if you own bump stocks, you are a federal felon, punishable by, what, 10 years in prison is the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, per offense. Yep. So literally, Firearms Policy Foundation, Firearms Policy Coalition, Gunners of America, the Second uh, Amendment Foundation, the NRA, and the NRA ILA. Look, man, if you got 50 bucks to give, kind of spread it around. They're all doing their own thing. They're all doing important things because the three things that we need to fight for gun rights in this country are activism, lobbying, and when those two things fail, we need litigation. Litigation. Exactly. I uh, listen. Suicide Prevention Line, uh, that number is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK, or you can text Aaron. 741. Don't text me. 741741. Oh. 741. <laughs> I'll tell you just, uh, you know, I care about you, but I don't care that much about you. <laughs> Aaron doesn't even care that much about himself. <laughs> uh, these days. <laughs> We're here live every week on Monday and Wednesday night and on demand every single day. Go to welikeshooting.com slash show to subscribe. And as we always say, th- thanks for listening. <laughs> Get some medical training and shoot, shoot straight. straight. <laughs> okay, guys, I got so many ideas. Uh, for the for the title, I've got all the fluff, none of the fatality. American Ninja, like Path, Path Seeker, Take Out Chuck Norris, Jeremy Mansplaining, and Mister Meaner. What about what about um, what about Black Guyver? The Black MacGyver? No, Black Guyver. No, I don't like that. All right, what do you think? Uh, Mick Ack. Mick Ack. 
Yeah, yeah. MacGyver and Black put together McGack. What about Takeout Chuck Norris? Mm, no. I like Jeremy like Mansplaining. He's years old. What about Mr. Mr. Meaner? Mr. Meaner is also very good. I think Mr. Meaner is pretty good. Aaron? I'm down. I'm down. Jeremy? I don't give a <laughs> Did you think that show was worth a dollar? Help the cast by visiting lovewls.com.